Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. It was the summer of 2016 and I had just got married by my longtime girlfriend. Over the course of our 12 year relationship, we had traveled to the mountains several times in both summer and winter for camping, but also to stay in nice mountain hotels and snowboard the slopes. Naturally, we both agreed this is how we wanted to spend the first few weeks of our marriage. We booked a 20 day stay at a mountainside campground on the other side of the country. We also decided to bring our dogs with us as they too love being outdoors and we generally bring them camping anyway. After two days of road tripping we had arrived, quickly set up, and settled in for a good long stay on the mountain. It was beautiful. A couple of days into our trip and we had already met a bunch of fellow campers. We were very experienced campers, so we generally attract a lot of attention from novice campers as they see we were all well set up. We are usually more than happy to help people get situated if they need matches, cream or sugar, or help setting up their equipment. It was day 4 or 5 when she first made her presence known to us. I will refer to this person as she or her as we never learned her name. We were sitting down under the shade of the large pine tree at the edge of our site, drinking beers and playing cards when she seemingly appeared out of nowhere. She was just suddenly right there. Can I pet your dog? She asked. Even my dogs didn't see her approach as the very sound of her voice triggered them into a startled frenzy. As the dogs were worked up already, I politely told her no. Then she just stood there, at the edge of our sight. Didn't say a word. Just stood there sort of existing, but not really doing anything. She wasn't exactly staring at us or looking at anything in particular. I asked her if she needed anything and she just said no. After a few minutes, she walked off. I work with people with brain injuries, so I've had my fair share of experiences with unusual behaviors, including people with poor social skills, so I wasn't about to write this person off as creepy just yet, but she had my attention. I casually watched her walk off and enter a campsite across the path and a few sites down from ours. There was already a small tent set up in the site, but she proceeded to pull an even smaller single person tent from her backpack and began setting it up. The day prior we saw two young girls set up the other tent and were clearly the occupants of the site. There was no further interaction with her that day, although we did notice that the owners of the other tent on the site were not around at all that day and we didn't see them return that night. The next morning, we decided to go on with our plans to day hike a good trail to a waterfall. The trailhead for this hike was accessible from the campgrounds, so we didn't have to drive to get there. We just walked the additional 2 kilometers to the trail. We walked a good pace so when we got to the trail, we decided to stop for a few minutes and take some photos of the surrounding mountains before heading into the thicker bush. After sitting there for maybe 5 minutes while my wife is taking pictures, she emerges from the trail that leads towards the campground. At first I thought, okay, coincidence. She's staying there and this is a pretty common trail. But then she says that I see her and she stops dead in her tracks and just stands there. Same demeanor as our first encounter. Just standing, not doing anything in particular, but also sending creep vibes our way. This was the first time I said to my wife, I think we have a stalker. Confused, my wife then looks to where I'm looking and is immediately a little creeped out. Once again I think, whatever, maybe she's just hiking the trail, no big deal. So we continue on the trail at a good pace and she maintains a consistent distance behind us. Our dogs at this point are a little distracted by her and our youngest dog keeps turning around to watch her. I got a little fed up with the dog constantly stopping to look back, so I decided we will all stop for some water and let this woman pass. Well what does she do? She stops walking when we stop and then once again just stands there. Okay, so now we are genuinely concerned and I start to wonder what this girl's intentions are. Standing motionless at the distance and refusing to pass us just ramped up the oh crap factor to about 9. So my wife and I agreed to just give in and cut the hike short by taking the shorter loop which is only another half kilometer ahead and head back to our camp. We managed to get some distance between us by jogging every time we would make a turn and she was out of sight. We didn't see her again until later that night. That night my wife decided to take an evening shower at the camp showers. When she returned to our camp she tells me our stalker was in the bathrooms also taking a shower. This time however she was with two other girls and appeared to be getting ready for a night at the club. There is a nearby ski town that has a few nightclubs and bars so it was reasonable to see the girls getting ready for a night out. The two girls she was with were the two we saw previously set up at their site. My wife explains that she quickly picked up on the fact that the two other girls and our stalker friend were not well known to each other. It was clear that the two girls were close friends with plans to go out partying 
and our stalker was making an attempt to be friends and sort of invited herself to join them in their night out. Now we know the ski town very well, and the girls kept reinforcing that they were meeting at a specific restaurant before going to the bar. It was currently 10.30pm and we know the restaurant they were telling her to go to was closed at 10pm. They were lying to her about their plans. The stalker kept asking them too, are you sure this place? Are you sure? They convinced her, and she then left to her tent to finish getting ready while the two friends stayed in the bathroom to finish their makeup. My wife went on to explain how after she left the two friends were mocking and making fun of our stalker. They were young 20-somethings acting like little girls in elementary school. My wife has no time for that, so creepy stalker or not, she had to say something to the girls for their behavior. My wife calls them out on their behavior. Well, putting all the bullying aside, the girls explained to my wife that the stalker girl had set up her tent on their site when they were staying with a friend at the ski town. When they returned, they found her living at their site without invitation. She had just taken it upon herself to take a little corner of their site without knowing them at all. The girls said they were upset with her and trying to make her feel uncomfortable so she would leave, but she wouldn't leave. Of course my wife asked them why they didn't just report her to the park warden. The excuse they gave was they were leaving the next day and didn't want to make a huge deal out of it. So whatever happened between them and the fake late dinner plans and clubbing is unknown to us. About 3am, that same night we were all awoken to a blood curdling scream right outside our camper. At first I was like, whoa, that must be a wild animal. My wife is trembling, dogs barking, and I am startled but curious. I peel back the window cover to see her, standing motionless on the path outside our trailer. I had the window cover down maybe 8-10 to 10 centimeters when she appears to make direct eye contact with me. My heart rate is jacked. After gazing in my general direction for what seemed like an eternity, she calmly turns around and walks to her tent. I go make sure our trailer is locked. After a good hour and a stiff whiskey, we manage to get back to sleep. So the next day is a Friday and we have friends from a nearby major city coming up to the mountains to spend the weekend with us. We haven't seen them in a while, so we are excited for a couple days together. Well, they are not at our site for 15 minutes, and as they are setting up their tent, she mysteriously appears out of nowhere yet again. Like bam, there she is but now this time she's actually in our sight. I hadn't had a chance to tell our friends about her before she arrived, so they were a little more friendly than I was. She asked me once again if she can pet my dog, who during all of this is barking at her. I think I said something like, she isn't being very friendly towards you right now, so I would prefer if you didn't. She didn't pet my dog, but she also just stood there staring at me like she was considering how she would dismember my limbs. She then notices our friend's tent brand as he is still setting it up and comments how it's the same model as hers, although a larger sleeping capacity. My buddy is picked up on the creep vibes and my general displeasure with her presence, so he just gives her the, oh yeah cool, and keeps setting it up. Well she starts grabbing at the tent pegs and picks up the hammer and says she will help him set it up cause she has experience with it. My buddy declines and asks for his tools back. Cue the psychopath stare down, but this time she has a hammer in hand. She literally just drops everything right there and runs off. I go on to explain the last few days to our friends and they agree we need to keep an eye on her. So by this time, the two girlfriends whose site she had hijacked were packed up and gone. It's now Friday night and we've been drinking all day so we're feeling pretty good. It's maybe about 11pm when she walks over to our site again. She says, hey, you guys seem to have a lot of extra room with the tent and camper. Do you think I could stay with you guys tonight? We could have a lot of fun in there together. My buddy's now just staring at her. Now this whole time, I'm just sitting in my camp chair with my whiskey taking this all in. She wasn't really taking notice to me at all so far. Then, out of nowhere, she smiles, turns her head and looks directly down at me and says, I like your friend. She then turns around and walks away into the darkness of the night towards the forest. We are now all terrified she is going to return. I decided right then and there, if we see her again in a creepy fashion, I am calling the park warden. This is just getting weird. Well, the night is winding down, so we all decide to walk together to the bathrooms to clean up for bed. My wife pulls on my hoodie and says, Babe, look. I look over to see that the site she was set up on is completely destroyed. Stuff everywhere. Just stuff, garbage, clothing, food, everywhere. I thought, okay, this is weird. Could this have been a bear? Well, no, we would have heard it. I then notice that the tent is gone. She is gone and left the site a complete mess. As luck would have it, the park patrol was completing their fire rounds and were at the messed up site when we were returning from the bathrooms. We told them there was a girl staying there who was acting erratic and we suspected she was squatting on the site based on our conversation with the two girls from earlier in the week. We didn't see her again for the rest of our trip until the last full day. There was a great little lookout point not far from our site which has amazing views of the river and valley below and it was a perfect evening to see the sunset behind the mountains. It was a lovely final send-off to an otherwise beautiful honeymoon. 
Just when we thought we were done with her, she emerged once again from seemingly nowhere. We were sitting on a couple of chairs that are bolted in place at the viewpoint, taking pictures of the valley below. As my wife is looking through the camera viewfinder, she picks up on the woman in the distance. She is standing in the woods a little ways down a mountain towards the valley, just watching us. As her final act, she walked up the mountainside and sat right behind us on a boulder that was beside the chairs. She says nothing, just sits there. My wife has the brilliant idea of asking me to take one last picture of the scenery and she gives me a little wink. I pick up on her idea right away and I position myself so this woman is going to be in the picture. My wife wanted this lady's photo in the event something bad happens with her before we can leave the area. We took our final looks out at the beautiful scenery and headed to our camp for the night. We didn't see or hear from her again. Upon reflection, we agreed there was obviously something wrong with this woman. She had zero social skills, and we did witness her attempt to make friends with those two girls that shafted her in a terrible way. That being said, she did things way beyond the realm of acceptable social awkwardness. There were moments I thought she would pull out a knife and kill us all where we stood. More than that, the stalking, the midnight screaming, and running off into the woods at night was terrifying to us. To our honeymoon stalker, let's not ever meet again. A lot of people may have heard about this girl. She was all over the news after she stalked a guy, bombarded him with 65,000 texts, and broke into his house all over one date. We met shortly after she went on that date with him and we were friends for a while before she broke into his house. At first, she seemed like a nice, albeit quirky, person. I met her when I spent a couple of months visiting the west coast of the US in summer 2017. I thought she was cute and we spent a lot of time together. We were living next door to each other for a few weeks and we were never really more than just friends. I stopped having any sort of non-platonic feelings after she started to talk a lot about a guy she had met on some dating website. Apparently he was her soulmate and she had somehow been guided to him by following her birth calendar. I would only later come to know that they had only been on one date and he never spoke to her again. I thought that was weird, but I enjoyed our conversations for the most part and she was funny and nice, so we remained friends. Eventually she moved on to short flings with a guy and then another girl from Tinder, all the while still talking to me about this guy that she was going to marry, saying that she liked about how jealous he got when she would tell him about hooking up with other people. A couple of weeks later she started to get really erratic. I confronted her a few times about how she was acting and she told me that she had recently stopped taking her meds but would start taking them again. She came home one day and decided to tell me that she had a court date coming up for a DUI. Her plan was instead to leave the country and go to South America. I told her what a dumb idea that was, and even though she actually went all the way to the airport in a different city, she wound up coming back. Apparently her soulmate was no longer answering her text, and she took that as a sign that she should drag herself back to where he was and fix their relationship. She was upset that he may be seeing other people even though he seemed okay to her that she was seeing other people. Later on she told me she had texted him and said if he blocked her she would know that meant he wanted her to come find him. Obviously he blocked her, and obviously that didn't go very well for her. So she moved a couple days later and the summer was ending and I moved back to the east coast. I didn't hear from her for a little while, but then we started talking again through text and whatsapp. She seemed like she was doing better. She told me she had found a roommate and was working on her art again and just generally seemed like she was in a better place. I was happy to have my friend back and healthy, but that didn't last longer than a couple of months. Eventually her behavior started to seem erratic again. She was sending dozens of texts at a time and they were all over the place. Several of them had to do with her soulmate and how she was still following him even though he had to call the police and block her. I told her to stop, try to get her to take her meds, and try to reason with her a hundred times. I was on the opposite side of the country and had no way of getting in touch with her family who I never knew about much or friends to try and get them to help her. She was a kind person and a good friend when she was taking care of her mental health and I cared about her, but I couldn't force her to take care of herself. One day I set aside some time to call her and I told her that she was overwhelming me and that she really needed to reach out to her family or someone who could help her. She told me I couldn't do that because she needed to stay with me or she would have to go back to her ex-husband. I don't think any of this is true, but she thought her ex-husband was going to have her killed or followed, that he had the entire police force in his pocket, and had paid off her family to give him intel on her whereabouts and what was going on in her life. I had just moved for a job and I lived in a small studio in a big city. I had no room for anyone to stay long term, and I wasn't about to do that anyways since she was starting to scare me at this point. She asked me if I was still living at my address, 
which really freaks me out because I had never given her my address or put it anywhere online and she wouldn't tell me how she got it. I asked her to leave me alone and told her we couldn't be friends anymore unless she took some steps to get better. She obviously didn't take this well. Though I hated my tiny, cramped apartment, the reason I was drawn to it was because it had a great security. It was actually on the upper floors of a hotel, although the hotel rooms were much nicer than the residence, and no one was allowed through the residence elevators unless the resident had given their name to security ahead of time and the guests had to show ID. After what happened next, I loved my cramped little apartment because the staff kept me safe. It had been over a week since I had talked to her because I blocked her number and blocked her on WhatsApp. She tried texting me from four different phone numbers, using text free, etc. But I just blocked them all and never responded. I was walking home from work one day and I was sure I saw her across the street from my building, but it was storming out and I didn't get a good view. I rushed upstairs and called myself down in my apartment. Maybe I was just being paranoid. It's a big city. Lots of people have brown hair and glasses. I'm just worried about her. But then the phone rang. The desk was calling to see if I had forgotten to let them know I had a visitor. My heart sank. I asked them who was waiting. They said they tried asking for her name or ID but she just walked out, and I knew it was her from the way they described her. I texted a mutual friend from over the summer. I wasn't really close with him, so we hadn't stayed in touch, but he told me she had lost it and that he blocked her too. Apparently she had gone back on the dating site she met her soulmate on and found someone who looked just like him in my city. She was convinced it was him and had to come find him. This was a very touristy city, but there was just no way this guy had coincidentally come out here. I was sure she had gone bonkers and I knew she was well aware of where that guy actually lived. I took a page out of her book and used a text free number to text her that she should leave me alone and I would call the cops if she ever came near me or my building again. In retrospect, I shouldn't have contacted her at all, but I was emotional and not using my better judgement. She said she just wanted to know if I could help her find something. She texted back really fast and didn't even try to hide it. Then I deleted the text free app so she couldn't reach me again. I lived in a very crowded area and I knew she couldn't get into my building, but I was still scared whenever I had to take public transit alone at night or was walking through less crowded areas to get home. I had a friend who used to work for the police, but not in this city or at the time this all happened, and she would drive or walk me home from work whenever she could for a while. She told me I should go ahead and report it even though they couldn't really do anything since she had to hurt me and nothing really happened, but I was embarrassed and again I didn't use my better judgement. I felt like it was my fault for engaging with her for so long. I knew she was unstable and I would still try to be her friend and help her. Maybe I gave her the wrong idea that I could do more for her. I ended up moving to a new city for another job after that and didn't hear from her again. I later found out the reason why was that a couple of months later she had once again gone back to Arizona and had been arrested for breaking into her soulmate's house and using his bathtub. They found a large knife in her car. I didn't want to go into much detail about her stalking of that guy and what she said about him in our text because I wanted to try and focus more on my personal experience with her instead of his. Okay, so this happened when I was around 9 years old. I'm 25 now, and it's something I will never forget. It gives me goosebumps to this day. I live in a terraced house, four houses combined, and my neighbors and I each have our own little patio. There's a small road 10 meters from my yard where people do their Sunday walks and so on. Only a small fence separates my small yard and patio from that road. I live in a pretty crowded area with several of these terraced houses spread around in my neighborhood. So seeing people walking on that road is pretty normal for me. Seeing random people standing on my patio is not. When I was 9, I usually got home from school about an hour before my mom got home from work. I live maybe about 50 meters away from my school, so my mom figured I was mature enough to be home alone for about an hour before she got home. This one day I got home from school. I did the usual thing which was to make sure I locked the front door and double checked that the back door leading to the patio was also locked. I was 9. Being alone was a little scary even though it was in the middle of the day and only for one hour. I then rushed to my room upstairs to play as much playstation as possible before my mom came home and made me do my homework. While playing, I heard this noise coming from outside my window. My room was located one floor over the patio, with a view to the road I told you about before. It was kinda like the sound of a cat, but my cat had been missing for over 3 months. Hope sparked and I thought, oh, did he finally come back? I ran downstairs to check if it was my cat, but the sight that met me gives me goosebumps just writing this. There was this guy standing on my patio, a tall guy with black hair covering half of his eyes, making him look like a male version of the ring woman or something. I could hear him making high pitched sounds, almost like a cat meowing. A brown liquid was running down from his mouth and I could see him spitting out my dad's stomped cigarettes. He was actually eating from the ashtray. I was frozen observing this. 
eventually snapped out of it and screamed so loud that the man must have heard it. He didn't react, he kept on eating from the ashtray. I ran upstairs to my room, locked the door, and called my mom who then called the cops. I'd never been more terrified in my life. Laying in bed under my sheets, shivering with fear as I hear these creepy high-pitched noises from the guy eating cigarette stomps from the ashtray on my patio. I kind of blacked out for a moment, because the next thing I remember is the police arriving on the road by my yard. I hear them talking to the guy saying stuff like, what are you doing? Get over here or we will come down and arrest you, and so on. He didn't respond, but the high-pitched sounds was more frequent and louder. I decided to look through the window, feeling safe now that the cops were there. I could see two police officers standing by my fence, one man and a woman. I did not see the creepy man however, because he was standing directly one story under me and my field of view. The police jumped the fence, and I remember hearing the creepy guy screaming louder than anything I've ever heard before. He charged the female police officer with full force and knocked her out cold. The male officer then immediately tased the guy, leaving him shaking on the ground, screaming still. The policeman struggled to keep him on the ground while putting handcuffs on him, but eventually made it. After a while, he managed to wake up the female police officer, who seemed to be badly hurt. He called for backup and an ambulance, and then he sees me standing in the window above him. The expression on my face must have been something else, because he just looked at me and said, I sure hope you didn't see all that. I started to cry. By this time, neighbors started to arrive wondering what was going on. One of my neighbors, an elderly woman, Maybe come down as she took care of me until my mom came back home. The police took the creepy guy with them in the car and left. Before they left, they promised to come back and talk to us about what happened. This is where the story takes an unexpected turn. The male police officer came back later that night and sat down with me and my mom to talk. He explained that the guy had a mental condition and had escaped a psychiatric hospital located around 5 kilometers from where I live. He explained that the guy had actually been living in my house 5 years ago, but he had been forced to move when his mom, his only caretaker, died. The poor guy probably thought he would find his mom in my house. He missed the routines and he missed living there with his mom. The police had to move him from the house that time 5 years ago, because he was extremely strong. From what I heard, he had extreme tensions in the body because of his condition, making his muscles grow stronger and stronger throughout the years. This is the reason he reacted the way he did when the police came to stay. So frightened, I told the police officer that he needed to make sure this would never happen again. He promised it wouldn't. After a few sleepless nights, my life got back to normal. The years went by and the guy didn't come back, until one year ago. At this time, my mom and dad had moved out. I bought the house from them and I'm still living there today. I was enjoying my morning coffee on the patio when I see this random guy stopping on the road by my fence. He just stands there, looking at me. I look at him and give him a nod, and then I hear the high-pitched noises. It's him. His hair had turned gray, but the high-pitched sounds made me realize. My heart started racing and I instantly remembered the reason why he was back. I realized that he must have managed to escape again. Because I kept my cool a bit longer than when I was 9, I started to realize how sorry I felt for the guy. 16 years later and he was back to look for his mom. I decided to carefully ask him if he wanted to come down to the patio. He instantly jumped the fence. I started to think he would knock me out like he did to that police officer. He didn't. He smiled. He looked at me and smiled. I offered him to come sit down. He didn't respond. I offered him to come inside. He started laughing. We went inside. His face lit up, pure joy. He was home. It reminded him of the life he had with his mom. It almost made me tear up. All of a sudden he sat down in my couch, turned on my TV, and switched directly to the cartoons. I observed him for a while. He was just completely focused on the cartoons. I just wanted him to enjoy the moment so I didn't say anything to him. I realized I had to call the hospital to let them know. The caretakers arrived 10 minutes later. After a lot of convincing, he got back up, crying, and then went back to the hospital. I called the hospital two days later. We made a deal. His name is Tom, and now I consider Tom my friend. Every Sunday from the day he returned, Tom and his caretakers would visit me to watch cartoons. They say it's the highlight of his week. It makes my heart warm. Now, for several years my thoughts were, let's not meet, guy on my patio eating from the ashtray. Now my thoughts are, let's meet every Sunday to watch cartoons, my friend Tom. This story from my past happened about 32 years ago in East Texas. My mom and dad divorced when I was 16 years old and my brothers and I lived with my mom. My dad visited us once in a while, but not really on a consistent basis. He was a gambler, one of the reasons my parents split up, and tended to not come around when he was broke. But on the rare occasion that he won big, he would visit and spend money on us and then disappear again. My dad said that he had a job as a shuttle driver from a local hotel. He told my brothers and me that the shuttle driving was just a cover, that he actually worked for organized crime, which he claimed owned the hotel. He said his real job was to drive out to various places in the area to pick up fugitives running from warrants, 
or otherwise wanted by law enforcement, bringing them to the hotel to hide, and then later, they would move on by means my dad said he didn't know. My dad always exaggerated or lied about things, so my brothers and I just blew it off and didn't think much of the claim, until something strange happened. My dad disappeared. It was 1988 and I was 22 years old and I was a college student still living at home. I worked as a full-time disc jockey on the overnight shift, 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. at a local radio station. My middle brother was 19 years old, lived in an apartment with a friend, and worked at a nearby Dairy Queen. My youngest brother was 9 and lived at home. One day my brother called my mom and me and asked us if we knew where my dad was. He says some men came to the Dairy Queen while he was at work and asked him if he'd seen my dad recently. My brother truthfully told him that he hadn't seen him or heard from my dad in months that he often does that, cuts off contact for months at a time. My brother said these men didn't say who they were, but seemed satisfied and left. My brother wondered if these men or anyone had a call to talk to us and ask us where my dad was. We also had not heard from my dad in months. The following day, my brother says the men returned to his work, and this time flashed badges and claimed to be FBI agents. He says they were very aggressive and demanded that my brother tell them where my dad was. My brother kept insisting, truthfully, that he didn't know where my dad was, that the last time he heard him, he worked at a local hotel as a shuttle driver. But the experience upset him, and he called my mom and me again. Upset, my mom called the hotel where my dad worked. The man she spoke to said my dad had disappeared weeks ago, and he had no idea where he went. The following day, my brother was at work when his roommate called and said that someone had apparently been in their apartment. The roommate claimed that when he got home from work, he found the sliding glass door open and the place ransacked, but nothing appeared to be missing. My brother, very upset, went to his apartment and found out that, in fact, his address book was missing from the breakfast nook, and a teddy bear he recently bought for his son and a photo of his son were missing from his bedroom. Now, my brother, my mom, and I were beside ourselves with anger, fear, and paranoia. We went to the local FBI office to complain that the FBI had done this, and to tell them once and for all, my brother does not know where my dad is. Well, as you might have guessed, the FBI claimed no knowledge of the event and claimed that they were not looking for my dad. They said none of their agents had contacted my brother. Furthermore, when my mother told them my dad had claimed that he worked for organized crime, the FBI would neither confirm nor deny that the hotel had tied to organized crime or that there was an investigation going on. My mom called the hotel again and told the manager that the men were looking for my dad and that they were terrorizing my brother, and flat out asked the guy if there was any truth to my dad's claim to be working for organized crime. The man laughed and told her, there's no such thing as the mafia. While we were trying to make sense of all these weird details, we kept wondering why my brother was being harassed but not my mother or me. That's when I was reminded of a weird event I had happened to me about two or three weeks prior. Because I worked overnight, I was often wide awake in the middle of the night on my days off, with nothing to do. One night, I went to the local cable TV company where my friend worked as a computer system operator to hang out with him for a few hours and BS a little. At about 3.30 a.m., he had a big computer job to do, so it was time for me to go home. So I left. As soon as I pulled out from his company's driveway, a car was immediately behind me, tailgating me. I mean, he was on me so quickly it scared the crap out of me. The car seemed to just appear out of nowhere. He also had his high beams on and was blinding me, and I couldn't make out anything about the car behind me. I couldn't see inside to see how many people were in the car, what they looked like, or anything. I couldn't even see what kind of car it was. I changed lanes to let the tailgater pass, but he changed lanes with me. I moved again, and he again moved. He was tailgating me and blinding me, and now seemed to be following me. I stopped at the intersection and got in the left turning lane, with my signal on, and he got behind me. Since there was no other traffic at all anywhere around, when the light changed, I zoomed across the intersection, streaked across all the lanes of traffic into the far right lane, and went through the intersection, trying to lose him. He followed me though. Now it was absolutely clear, he was for sure following me. I cut into a nearby neighborhood and tried to lose him, but he kept following me anyway. I finally managed to zoom back out to the intersection, and crossed over and went to the 7-Eleven at the corner, and jumped out and ran inside and yelled to the clerk that someone was following me. As I did, I saw the car that was following me cut through the parking lot of the 7-Eleven, and for the first time, I got a look at the car. It was a late model tan colored four-door, and there were two guys in it. The clerk just blew me off and said I was exaggerating, that it was probably just kids messy with me, and to let it go. I left, but I was still spooked by it, and didn't want to go straight home. I was afraid they might follow me, and I didn't want them to know where I lived, so I went to my workplace. I knew that the disc jockey on the air that night would be my friend Paula, so I decided to go visit her on the air for a little while and hang out and calm down. I told her what happened and hung out for about two hours. She also felt it was probably just some punks being jerks, and that calmed me down. But when I got home, now over two hours since this car harassed me, the car was at my house. As I was coming down the street to my apartments and about to turn right, I saw the car pull out of my apartments and as it passed me, they flashed their high beams on and off at me. It was them. I panicked and called Paula at the radio station and told her what happened. She was freaked. 
She was like, why would they wait for you at home? Who is this? Call the police. I was freaked out as to how they could possibly know where I lived. Why would they wait two hours for me, and then when they finally saw me, flash their lights at me and just leave? But now, remembering that event and putting it together with my brother's quote-unquote FBI visit and apartment break-in, it seemed obvious that it was all tied together. I hadn't thought about it before, but now I remembered. My car was actually my dad's car. He gave it to me about two months earlier when he got a new one. So if someone had been looking for my dad, they might have thought I was him. And when they saw me coming home, realized I'm not him and just left. But who was messing with us and why? Where was my dad? Why are these strange people harassing us? My mom, my brother, and I went to the local police and filed a missing persons report and a complaint. We spoke to a very nice detective. About five days later, we got a call from the detective. He had solved the whole strange case. It turns out, my dad disappeared because he owed his employers more than $50,000 in gambling debts. The detective confirmed that my dad did work for some unsavored characters, but said they weren't organized crime per se. He had no idea if my dad was shuttling fugitives or not. He said my dad was hiding out in Nevada, and that he had spoken to him, and he was alive and well, but hiding. We asked, then who were those men, and why were they bothering my brother? The detective explained that it's not uncommon for unsavory bounty hunters and debt collectors to impersonate law enforcement and call and harass people. My brother asked, how did they get in his apartment? The detective said a sliding door is easy peasy to open, and they probably stole a dress book hoping it had my dad's contact information in it. They stole the teddy bear and pictures to use to scare my brother, which worked. I asked the detective why the men only harassed my brother and not my mom and me. The detective said, because my dad had used my brother as a reference on his job application at the hotel, he gave my brother's address and phone number. The FBI agents probably figured he was close to my dad and either maintained contact with him or if threatened, would contact him. So, my dad eventually turned back up in town and acted like nothing had ever happened. He never spoke of the incident and we never brought it back up. I guess he got the money he owed them, but I don't know. Hopefully, this never happens again. I had this friend who was really into the occult. Unfortunately, I was the one who got him turned on to it. We had a mutual appreciation of all things weird, so I thought the subject would interest him. He started going deep into the subject to the point where he wouldn't talk about anything else. He would actually interrupt a conversation and force the subject back to occult matters. Rude, but sometimes people go through phases where their interest is all they want to talk about. It was a mostly forgivable offense. I think I should mention that this particular friend didn't have a very large friend circle. His depression and introverted nature kept him inside a lot. His world was kind of small, and I did enjoy hanging out with him, so I did my best to be a good friend. I didn't want to just brush him off because he was acting a little weirder than normal. Honestly, for the longest time, he was a totally normal guy. We chat and play games together on the PlayStation. Sometimes we'd go see movies with my boyfriend accompanying us. We all hung out at the park, we went swimming, overall we had a good time hanging out. Things started to go downhill when he started to smoke DMT. Personally, I think psychedelics are amazing tools that can offer insight into your life, but they should be treated with respect. My friend got to the point where he was making it himself, apparently a pretty easy thing to do after a meager amount of research, and he was smoking it daily, multiple times a day. For those of you who aren't familiar with the substance, when you smoke it, you get transported to a different world, an entirely new plane of existence. Your body and yourself don't exist anymore, you're just exploring this alternate reality dreamscape. My personal experience with it led me to seeing a dragon once in the kaleidoscope of a cornucopia. People see all kinds of different things there. Imagine what this does to a person when they're smoking it 30 times a day. He started telling me things like he was the reincarnate Osiris. He said he was seeing Egyptian hieroglyphics all over the place in walking life. Apparently he had hour long conversations with entities in his bedroom even when he wasn't smoking DMT. Of course I was very alarmed to hear all of this and I told him he needed to take a serious break. No drugs at all for a few months so he could find a solid footing in reality again. At this point I was still hanging out with him because he obviously needed some help. And like I said before, he didn't have a lot of friends that could give him that. He was also the black sheep of the family, so I knew he wasn't getting any kind of support from them. He was really close to his sister, and I did reach out to her on Facebook to express my concerns. I pushed her to talk to him until he needed some psychiatric help, because he was slipping past the point of no return. I'm not really sure if she took my messages seriously, since we didn't really know each other. Plus, she is at least six years younger than us, and possibly didn't grasp how serious the situation was becoming. In any case... I'll jump forward now to the part where things start to get really creepy. My boyfriend had made arrangements to hang out with our friend at the park. I didn't really want to go because I felt like I needed a break from him and his nonsensical ranting. I just couldn't deal with it on that particular day. My boyfriend said he wasn't all that bad and we went anyway. 
We get to the park and he is his usual self, ranting about Egypt and made up gods that only he knew the truth about, etc. He also had this large hunting knife that he kept fiddling with the whole time we were on a walk. He told us that he had been using it in ceremonial magic, and that it helped to banish negative thoughts. It made me extremely uneasy. He would do this thing where he would take the knife and make stabby motions near his heart or head, like he was mock stabbing himself, all while holding a conversation with me or my boyfriend. I think we were both really on edge and didn't know what to say or do about it. I tried to distract him from doing it by bringing up other subjects that might interest him, but he kept on with this ritual. Keep in mind, we were all walking a trail, so it wasn't like we could just say goodbye then and there. We had to walk back to our car and drop him off at his car. My boyfriend had the bright idea that we should get some lunch after our walk even though I was doing my best to give him a look that said, no, why do you think I want to spend any more time with him? But it must have not been very effective, or my boyfriend was ignoring it, not sure. Either way, we ended up getting in the car to go get lunch. In the car I was driving, my boyfriend was in the passenger seat, and our weirdo friend was in the back. As we're heading through a busy part of town, where all the shopping and restaurants are, I hear the distinctive sound of a belt buckle coming undone. Then I hear the worst sound imaginable. I peek out of the corner of my eye, and my suspicions were confirmed. He was full on... Yeah, I felt sick to my stomach and all the nervous energy I had throughout the day popped up into my head. I was trying not to shake and trying to ignore it and drive through heavy traffic. I kind of had a freeze response I guess. The whole time I kept thinking about that huge knife he had in his pocket and obviously he was completely off his rocker now. I was afraid to say anything or confront him because I didn't know how he was going to react. This part is weird, but my boyfriend didn't seem to notice and the whole time he kept rambling on about whatever knows what. I couldn't listen because my thoughts were 100% focused on driving and trying to act like I didn't know what was going on in my backseat. We get to the restaurant and my boyfriend runs inside to grab food. I'm left alone in the car with our friend and I try to act like I'm browsing on my phone when really all I hear is what is going on back there. My boyfriend gets back and I complain that I'm tired. It's been a long day, let's drop him off, etc. So I drive us back to our friend's car and he doesn't get out of our vehicle, he just sits there. I have to get a little bit rude and ask him to please get out and go home. He gets out of our car and walks over to his passenger side. I start getting really scared and I suspected the worst. He pulled a gun out of some kind of bag he had on the seat and he just walks over to our car with it. I don't know why I did this, but I was so pissed I just got out the car and walked up right to him. I was maybe 3 feet away and could see it was a loaded 9mm. I kept asking him over and over, what are you doing? Because apparently that's all my brain could think to do. I told him to get into his car and go home. He never said anything during this whole time, just kind of cried and had this wild look in his eye. For whatever reason, he got back into his car and drove off. I told my boyfriend obviously we were never hanging out with him again and that I didn't even want him to talk to him anymore. No contact, nada. A few months pass and he occasionally messages me through the PlayStation or texts my phone. He says a lot of random stuff and I just ignore it. It turns out he moved down to Tennessee near Nashville. I don't know why. He had a roommate and I think their girlfriend lived there. I'm not really sure about the situation. I think maybe he's turning his life around and getting a fresh start down there. I think it's best to cut all contact and let him regroup. I'm not interested in any kind of friendship with him and I know he needed help beyond what I could offer. Again, I reached out to his sister and let her know that he had a gun. She managed to get it from him somehow but it did little good in the end. I get a call around 11pm one night that wakes me up. It's a man claiming he's a detective down in Gallatin, Tennessee and my heart skips a beat. I start sweating and immediately asked what happened. Apparently my former friend stabbed someone to death on Halloween day. I don't know all the details and the articles about it are kind of sparse. The whole thing is really surreal and I'm just left feeling like I'm lucky that I didn't get shot last summer. This whole thing turned out way longer than I meant it to be, but that's the story. I'm glad I don't have to meet him again. I work at a popular coffee chain, generally during afternoon and closing shifts. This night in particular, we had a very young crew for closing, which happens at 10.30pm. For reference, we have our shift lead, who we will call Sarah myself and my co-worker, who we will call Mia, and another co-worker, who we will call D. It had been a relatively slow night, with only a few loyal regulars dropping by. Both drive through and the cafe was empty, as heavy rainfall started and no one wanted to be out. I was in the front of the store cleaning while the rest of my co-workers were in the back of the store, when an older man walks in. He wore odd clothing, a bit strange for the human weather, full black attire with combat boots, a heavy red jacket, and a beanie on his head obscuring his hair. 
I brushed it off as protection from the storm and figured he worked outside, and went to ask if he had placed an online order as he stood at the mobile counter. Putting on my customer service voice, and went through my standard spiel, and was alarmed when instead of responding, he places a bag on the counter and starts pulling out DVDs. Once he finishes pulling out a stack of 10 or so, he stares past me to the back room where my co-workers were obviously chatting, and then makes a lap around the store, eyeing me the entire time and not speaking a word. He backs out of the front door and walks out to his truck, which I now see is a large black pickup. Freaked out, I stupidly grab the stack of DVDs and run back to my co-workers. They're immediately alarmed by my Demeter and ask me what's wrong. I hold out the DVDs and let them inspect them while I explain what happened. Much to my discomfort, Sarah points out that all the movies are either about murders or kidnappings. Slightly pissed off and extremely uncomfortable, we make the decision to call my manager. He picks up and Sarah explains the situation, who are freaked out probably more than I am at that time. He tells us that there's nothing we can do about it but to call back if anything else happens. So we hang up and move back to the front of the store as a group. Things go on as usual, but with an air of fear about us. Mia sticks to my side and D to Sarah's. The man's truck had pulled off at that point, but much to my dismay, had only pulled it to the now closed grocery store next door that had a clear view into the drive through window. A few cars pulled through the drive through and I even had a few customers ask if I was alright due to my what I assumed to be terrified face. I've always had a pretty good intuition about things, and this felt more wrong than anything I've ever felt. A bit more time passes by, and it's now time for Dee to leave. With the man still in the parking lot next door, we decided it would probably be best for her boyfriend, we'll call him Daniel, to come pick her up. This wasn't an irregular occurrence, and we didn't want him following her home. Mia then points out that a van had been sitting in the back of the parking lot for almost an hour at that point, which we had not noticed previously. Another gut feeling hits, and I make the decision to lock the door. Daniel tells her he's on the way, and I inform my manager that we close the cafe for peace of mind, which he was fine with as business was slow. Now Sarah and Dee are in the back, and Mia and I are up front. I go about cleaning the machines and trying to make idle chatter to keep her calm, which is no small feat as she jumps every time she hears someone steaming milk. As we're talking and I have my back turned to her, she screams mid-sentence, get out. Alarmed, I rip around to where she is, standing near the counter close to the drive through window, and saw her pointing to a shadowy figure climbing through the window. Grabbing her arm, I yank Mia behind me and grab the hot bucket of sanitizer that I had been using to scrub the counters around the machines. I throw the liquid onto him, simultaneously pushing the man out of the window, which he only had his shoulders through, with a big red bucket now on his head. If you work in food service, you know the ones. The bulky ones. At that time, Daniel pulls up outside. Mia's now yelling for someone to call the police, and I see D in my peripheral running outside to our new savior. I slam the drive through windows shut and lock them, with the man still laying on the ground struggling to get his bearings. I couldn't tell you how much time passed, although it couldn't have been more than 15 to 30 seconds, before I see Daniel rush the man, who was now on his knees, and pin him to the ground. Sarah and Mia were now pulling me back to the store, with both fighting back sobs and Sarah on the phone with the police. Thankfully, we have some awesome regulars who are also deputies that arrived within 5 minutes of our call and arrested the man. The aftermath was messy, but they eventually pinned him as a member of a local trafficking ring that had been caught years prior and let out on bail. Oh yeah, and the van in the back that had kept D from leaving the first place? It hightailed it out of the parking lot in the middle of all the action but was eventually traced back to people who were also a part of the ring. Even though I won't be releasing names or such as legal proceedings are still happening, but I figured I would tell my story here. I still work there, and I'm very grateful for Daniel who very well could have saved all of our lives in that moment. He managed to keep the man pinned the entire time until the police arrived and disarmed him. The true hero of the story, although I do pride myself on my quick thinking for getting him out of the store. Moral of the story, trust your gut feelings, and always have a steaming hot bucket of sanitizer on hand. A dog sit for a family friend. They much prefer to have someone stay at their house with the dogs. I grew up in a town in the middle of nowhere and I love the countryside. So for me, this is like a staycation because I live in the city now and I never have any time for myself. Anyway, their house is out in the middle of nowhere. When I say nowhere, I mean this place takes 2 hours to get to from my work and is about 45 minutes to the nearest town slash interstate. There is one neighbor within 5 miles and he lives directly across the street. I'm used to this where I'm from. It's supposed to give you the space you need, but also help you to feel safer knowing you have at least one person nearby. However, this guy has done nothing but make me feel unsafe. So I get to Terry and Johnny's house and they're telling me the drill. When to feed dogs, two super cute spoiled Australian cattle dogs, water plants, etc. Then, as they're loading up their stuff to take it to the car, Terry says, Oh, don't forget to tell her about Steve. John says, Oh yeah, don't worry about the neighbor across the street, he's harmless. 
The guy drinks a lot and is a little off, but totally harmless. The guy has lost his license so many times, so all he can do is drive a moped to get to town. However, just in case, this is where we keep the gun. He then takes me to his gun and explains that it's loaded, and if I were to use it, if I don't need to cock it, just pull the trigger extra hard. At this point, I'm like, whatever. You keep a gun in your house when it takes police at least 45 minutes to get to your home. Still, I've got no worries, I'm used to drunk weirdos. I love this life in the middle of nowhere, and I've got two protective dogs that will attack on a one word command, so I'm feeling pretty safe. Terry and Johnny leave around 3pm. I took the dogs for a walk and play some frisbee and begin to unload my stuff while they're still worn out from all the running. As I come back out for my second load of stuff, I'm staying there for a week and needed work clothes and my xbox to keep myself entertained in the late evenings. I hear their neighbor, Steve, slam his door and seemingly have a phone conversation. I first just hear his voice faintly, then he yells, where did you go? The dogs are hearing him now and start to growl softly. I say, calm down boys, it's alright. It's just Steve, remember? He probably wants some privacy. Let's go inside. As I grab my stuff, I hear him yell again, I do care about my kids. And then I hear him throw something on the unpaved road behind me. Turns out to be his cell phone. As I'm grabbing my stuff, the dogs start going crazy and run a few feet behind me, barking and growling viciously. I drop my stuff and turn around to see the neighbor at the end of the driveway probably 50 to 75 feet away, just staring at me. I yell at the dogs to calm down and to get back at my side. They do. I then give a friendly wave to Steve. In my head I'm thinking, this is kind of weird, but he's probably been drinking. Plus, they said the guy is harmless and have dogs at before, and never had a problem with neighbors. He then takes a single step forward and says in a manipulative sounding voice, you alright? Steve is wearing dirty jeans, work boots, a dirty red hoodie, and a red hat. He's also got brown dirty hair to his shoulders and a beard that's probably 5 inches long. Yeah, I'm pretty good. My name is Piff. Just dog sitting for Johnny and Terry this week and ready to get in and call it an evening with the boys. I look down at the dogs to see the reaction. They look like they're about to attack and I'd never seen them like this before. How about yourself? We sat in silence for about 30 seconds before he stated, I'm asking if you're alright. I'm Steve. Nice to meet you Steve. Thanks for being a good neighbor and checking but like I said, I'm good. Are you alright? Again, silence. Now this silence lasts for probably a whole minute and I figure, he's wasted. I should just get inside with my stuff. So I turn around and finish grabbing my stuff, and as I do, I hear him take one more step on the gravel driveway. Dogs bark again. I turn around and Steve says, I know them. Them dogs won't do nothing to me. They are some good dogs, that's for sure. I begin feeling super uneasy, so I close my trunk and turn around to see if he's going to say something else. I was about to tell him that I was going inside, and then instead awkwardly say, yeah, I'm, he cut me off. Yeah what? He yelled. I'm shocked and say, yeah I'm going inside now. Thanks again for checking Steve. I'm fine. I've got the dogs this week. Have a good night. I turn and go and the dogs follow me with no problem. Steve continues to stand where I left him for literally 10 minutes just staring at the house. Note, this house does not have a front door. There's a side door and a back door. The back door is the main door because the front of the house has those big green fluffy privacy trees so I can't even see his house through the front window. You can't see either doors from the street. You have to come onto the property to see them. It's about 6 o'clock where I'm at, and the sun starts going down around then, but doesn't actually get dark until about 9.15pm during the summer. Anyway, the dogs and I are on the couch, and I've got my headphones on while playing the Xbox. All of a sudden, the dogs flip their mess, running towards the back door barking and growling. I'm like, they don't do that unless someone pulls up into their car, and they don't know who it is. I'm not having anyone over. So I grab my knife, which is always close by, and start walking towards the back door. The dogs are still going crazy, and I have no idea what they're looking at. I don't see anything, but then I look closer. I see moped tail lights in the driveway seemingly hiding behind my car. I then try and focus in, and see that Steve is turned around staring at the back of the house from his moped, ducking behind my car. I get the dogs to be quiet, and I hide to see what he's doing. The dogs are still growling, but at least they're not giving away my location right now. I watch him for 5 minutes. No movement, just a creepy stare in my general direction. I don't think that he could see me, but I'm not sure. He then shuts off his moped and crouches next to my car, where I can see him now peeking into my car windows. When I lived in the country, I never locked any doors. Not my house, not my car, nothing. Since I work and live downtown, I naturally keep all of my doors locked all the time. I don't see him try and get into it, but he walks around it a few times. He's not crouching anymore. Obviously, he feels like no one is watching him or cares that he's looking into my car, but he has only taken a single step. Stopping looking into my car, then at the house. Repeat. A single step at a time. At this point, I text Terry and tell her that Steve is doing some weird stuff, and I tell her I'm starting to feel uncomfortable. 
I get a text back reading, call the cops if you feel unsafe. They know him. They could come talk to him. Remind me to tell you about the time he was standing out by the tree at 6am when I was leaving for work and when we get back. We think he had a psychotic break. How comforting, right? So, I talk myself down some. This guy is just wasted. However, if he starts getting close to the car, I'm calling the cops. Dumb idea looking back because the cops take so long to get out there. I'm watching him as he's made his second round looking into my car. He then gets on his moped and drives off. As he passes the window that faces the driveway, he sped up, trying to make it so I wouldn't see him if I were just watching TV. Now it's like 8pm and the dogs start going crazy again. I look out and now his moped is parked in plain view and he is standing on the walkway just 30 feet from the house, staring and talking to himself. I had previously turned off all the lights so that he couldn't see easily in and see what I was doing. I see him take a single step towards the door, now about 30 feet away. I grab the gun. I've calmed the dogs down and they are in full on protective mode. One dog to my left and one to my right. It's about 8.15pm now and I call the cops. I explain the situation and that the owners think he had a psychotic break. As I'm halfway through explaining why I'm starting to fear for my safety, the operator says, Ma'am, what is your address again? I tell her, I'm sorry ma'am, but you're not located in our county. I will have to transfer you to county. Are you serious? The owner said that the cops in South know him very well and how to handle him. Isn't that you guys? Yes ma'am, that is us, but you are located in a different county. That is not our jurisdiction. But the guy who is bothering me lives in your county. That is why I'm calling you. The operator then transfers me to another county. When she answers the phone with the average, 911, what's your emergency? I'm silent. I'm looking out the kitchen window and Steve has come up about 4-5 to five feet since the last time I looked out there. 911, what's your emergency? I then explain what's happening and explain that I was just transferred because I am apparently not in their jurisdiction. She then tells me to remain calm and to turn on all the lights. I said, this guy is waiting for me to do something like that. The doors are locked and I do have a firearm. If he enters, I will shoot. She then tells me that it is the safest with the lights on. I turn on the lights. He notices. Turns and gets on his moped and drives back to his house. I tell her what happened. She asked if I would still like to have an officer come out. Yes, I want an officer to come out. Apparently the cops in South know him, but she transferred me to you. This is the third time he's come onto this property and he's getting closer and closer to the door. I do not feel safe. Someone that is not me needs to talk to this guy. Calm down, ma'am. We will still send somebody. However, based on where you are and located, it will take a while for one to get out there. That's fine. I just want someone out here. Thank you. I asked her if she would stay on the line until he got out here or no. She says that one is on his way, but she needs to be available if anyone else calls in. She told me if he comes back and I'm still feeling uneasy to call them without hesitation. Now it's about 9pm and the sun is getting ready to set completely. Again, the dogs go crazy. Now I'm getting really pissed off and walking around the house with a loaded gun so that if Steve sees me, he sees that gun too. I look out the window and see his moped, but I don't see him. Where is he? From the window in the kitchen, I can't see the back door. So I go upstairs, one dog follows, the other is too old to climb the stairs, and peek down through the bathroom window. Steve is on the back porch lighting matches and throwing them down onto the wooden porch. He doesn't seem harmless anymore. He's talking to himself and twisting his head back and forth like he's getting warmed up to fight or having a conversation with another one of his personalities or something. I start filming him from the upstairs window, just in case I die, you know, so that I could hide my phone and when they found it, they'd know it had to be this guy. The sun is down and it's starting to get dark. He steps up to the door and starts knocking. He then starts pounding on the door. I'm pretty good at staying calm in these type of situations, but my heart started beating so fast that my Fitbit had to change my heart rate tab every two seconds. If he gets in here, I'm going to have to kill this guy or he's going to kill me. I could see pure hate in his eyes. Then he stops pounding at the door, quickly turns away and runs to his moped, starts it and takes off faster than I thought a moped could go. Not even a minute later, the cop pulls into the driveway. I had mentioned to the dispatch operator that I have two dogs who will bark at the officer but will not attack unless given a specific word. They are trained and I do have a firearm. I will leave the firearm inside when I go to meet the officer. I met the officer, the dogs in a growl, simply gave a single bark apiece to let me know that someone was here. I went outside to meet him and told him that the guy just took off on a moped. He says, oh yeah, I think I just passed him when I turned onto the road. I explained that he is absolutely drunk or crazy and if he sees him on his way back that he should definitely pull him over because I'm quite positive he's under the influence of something. Normal people just don't act that way. The cop basically shrugs everything off and says, well, are you going to stay here tonight? I told him no, I will leave the dogs overnight and come back in the morning. I asked him to stay while I packed everything up, he nodded. 
I go inside, give the dogs love and treats, and crate them for the night. I take off and return the next day with my dad. My dad begins walking the perimeter to try and show him that a man is also staying here. I'm a 24 year old female, if you're wondering. Then Steve, wearing the same dirty outfit and hat, while holding a 24 case of Budweiser, is standing at the end of the driveway again. I'm watching him from the front window. I see my dad at the other end of the yard. As he comes into view, Steve turns around and walks back into his house. I later learn that Steve has been to jail multiple times. His kids are not allowed to see him due to his violent nature, and he bought a four-wheeler. No one knows how he gets his money to get these things. Terry and Johnny have never seen him leave for work. They've only seen him leave on his moped or four-wheeler empty-handed for an hour or two and return with a case or two of beer. I don't know who he thought I was, but every time he looked at the house in my direction, there was just pure hate in his eyes. Who knows what would have happened if I hadn't called the cops as early as I did. This may be a ramble of thoughts, but after recently stumbling upon this sub, I finally felt a place I could offer something that my family and I experienced a few years ago and that to this day gives me a shiver. I have been camping, solo backpacking, and hunting my whole life in Oregon, and felt comfortable in the woods and have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago my wife, daughter, and two German shepherds went camping north of Mount Jefferson, Oregon. I have included the coordinates of our campsite which we found to be the perfect setup for us and our two dogs who need the privacy since they are intimidating to other dog owners and can be loud when spooked. It was not an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off of a USFS road that had flat ground full trees and a fire pit. The first night my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours. It was maybe two feet away from me and my wife's tent. We made the male German Shepherd sleep, Guts is his name, with her in the tent. That whole first night neither my wife and I could sleep. We both heard footsteps and they were heavy, not like typical forest critters scampering around the night. I was well armed because I was paranoid from reading recently before departing about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say, both my wife and I had two pistols and my rifle with me. The dogs are great at detection, and that is why I felt my daughter could sleep alone because Guts is completely fearless and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night, which I ultimately decided was deer or maybe some elk. Day 2. Morning. We go for a walk down the road and maybe 300 feet away see the circle area in the photo. I see an abandoned road where a rusted gatepost, gate was missing, was covered in vegetation. Something of blue color caught my eye and Guts immediately takes off running down this abandoned road. My heart begins to race because I think it's another family camping like us and he's going to get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death so I chase after him as fast as I can and the rest follow. He stops after 20 feet into the road and me yelling his name but I have covered just enough distance to see that there is nobody there and something is off about the site. I yell, hello, is anyone there? Sorry about the dog. I got no response. My curiosity gets the best of me and I have to see what the site conditions were. As I get closer, I know something is wrong. It had all the necessities for a campsite including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table, but every single item had been completely destroyed smashed and torn from what appeared to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles, puzzled why anyone would leave all their camping gear behind, including an expensive REI tent. I figured well someone left in a hurry and animals got to the rest as the only logical explanation. Still a propane tank and cooler were flattened by something, and it certainly wasn't snowpack with tree coverage in that spot. As the afternoon rolls in, me and my daughter are playing ball at the campsite, and my wife goes walking maybe about 70 feet north to do her business. I do not have direct line of sight on her, but all of a sudden I see Guts make a mad dash straight towards her. Normally he would always be with me unless he is called over and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention and I knew something weird was happening. So I ran over there and my wife starts jogging at me and I immediately draw my pistol. Guts has completely continued running to the forest another 100 feet before I call him and he stopped. My other dog Leia, who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader, is not taking point. I have had her for now 7 years and this is the first time in her life she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was full hair raised and attached to us at the hip. Again, anytime we hike or play, Leia is up front bossing everything in her path and pauses to look to see where we are and continues. I asked my wife what happened and she said, I was trying to pee and all of a sudden I felt all my hairs raise. I know someone was watching me. And then I saw guts running towards me and I just got up to move towards you. We spent 10 minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails. Broken branches nothing to point to what and where something went. We decided we are spending one more night since it's too late to pack up and drive but we will all be in the big tent together. 
Before we go to bed, I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used a mid can and some coins and keys from our truck and zip tied it, so anything hitting the rope gave a little jingle. Very unsophisticated, but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent, our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the exact same thing I have done with a rope that was so old and brown, I didn't see it at first. It was broken and only a few pieces remained, but sure enough it was tied at roughly the same height about 8-10 to 10 inches off the ground, and even had a few rushed washers on it. I immediately felt someone had stayed here before and put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree, maybe 10-15 to 15 years ago, based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia has now reached a new height, but I had to make sure the girls felt we are safe, and at the time, the only thing I could think of was when the evening came around, I made them sit in the truck and I fired a clip of my 45 into the dirt as a signal to whatever was out there that we are armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that now knows we have two wolves and are armed and we are too risky of a target so we can sleep safely. That night we heard no footsteps and the dogs never perked up or barked. We left early the next morning. Fast forward to today and I watched the Amazon Missing 411 Hunting documentary and I noticed the cluster smack dab close to where we camped that weekend and a flood of dread rushes me as I think of that mysterious abandoned campsite with a ripped tent and smashed cooler and cooktop. We have been camping since and have enjoyed the beauty of the NW, but there was something there at that place that possibly took or harmed someone else less than 300 feet away from where we camped, and we all think our lucky star's guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon. I live in a small rural community in the eastern US. It's a nice little town. Because of my work in the medical field, I've met some interesting people. I'm also familiar with law enforcement and emergency personnel. I'll go ahead and start the story. Because it's still very recent and the investigation is ongoing, I have to be vague with some details. I'm single and I live alone. Due to a stalker, I've moved twice, but that's another story for another time. However, it is relevant for this story for multiple reasons. The first reason being that I have a dog for the sake of protection as well as have motion sensors and outdoor security cameras. The second reason being the location of my home, which is literally down the street from the first apartment. I can see it from my living room window, and a couple blocks from the police station. However, next to the fire department is the road department, which is basically a parking lot where they park their road equipment and empty garbage trucks at night and on weekends. Oddly, it doesn't have a security camera. Small town life, I suppose. My house sits on a hill with a good view of that side of the street. Due to the incline, the large trees in the front yard, and the half cornfield on the property next to me, most people on the street below wouldn't notice me in the backyard unless they were actively looking. However, I can see the street clearly. This incident happened Saturday evening. The county was holding its annual Independence Day spiel with a community barbecue, music, fireworks, etc. I did not attend because it's just not my thing. Before the big show, I took the dog out to relieve herself in the backyard. There was still at least an hour of daylight left, but the entire neighborhood was pretty quiet because most everyone was at the fairgrounds or various other holiday events. So when an unfamiliar, large, white pickup truck drove slowly down the street, I noticed. It must have turned around at the end of the street because I saw it again, moving in the opposite direction, only about 20 seconds later. This time, it turned into the parking lot of the road department. Now, people have been known to toss things into empty garbage trucks, usually at night to avoid getting caught, because they don't want to or are unable to make the trip to the landfill themselves. Usually, it's things like furniture or broken equipment, but I didn't see any of those things in the back of this truck. The driver was a somewhat stocky guy of average height. He took three large, black trash bags from the bed of his truck and tossed them in one by one into the hopper of the garbage truck. Then, he left. Now, I'm not one of those meddling, rear window types who always thinks activity is suspicious and that their neighbors are up to no good, but something about this didn't sit right with me. Normally, when I see people tossing their garbage into the trucks and leaving, I don't bother reporting it because it's relatively harmless. But this time, I had a gut feeling, so I called the police. If anything, they could get the guy for illegally dumping trash from a barbecue or whatever. While I'm on the phone with dispatch, I put my dog inside to cut down on distractions while the officers investigate. A few minutes later, an officer arrived and I crossed the street to meet him. Gave him a description of the events and pointed out which of the trucks the man had tossed the bags. He found the bags. He took photos. He put on gloves and told me to stay back. The bags were tied in a knot at the top and it took him a minute to untie one because of the gloves and how tight the knot was but eventually he got it open, looked inside for a few seconds, then twisted it closed and took a few steps back. Oh, he hissed under his breath. What? I asked. It's a body. I felt sick. I could tell he felt sick too. I saw him grow pale. 
His hand was trembling when he held the radio. Even his voice was shaking as he gave the code to dispatch. The dispatcher sounded confused when she asked him to repeat it. Within 10 minutes, the county sheriff was on the scene. Even he looked sick at the contents of the bag. The coroner arrived 10 minutes after that and the first officer walked me back to the house along with another one who arrived at the same time as the coroner. Though I showed the first cop via the app on my phone when I described the events initially, I now showed them the video on a larger screen. The camera caught footage of the truck as it drove by both times as well as pulling into the parking lot, though unfortunately, not a clear view of the license plate or of the man tossing the bags out of frame. We watched the footage over and over, pausing frames, the officers taking notes. Ultimately, they requested this footage as well as a copy of the files from the past week to see if the truck had been in the area before. I've also been saving footage until the road department installs their own camera this week. Because this is still fresh, I don't know many more details. I know the body was in pieces, but I don't know the age of the victim, the gender, cause of death, any of that. Information has not been released to the public. I don't know if the coroner has ever been able to identify the body yet. A police cruiser has been parked at the fire department next door for constant surveillance in case the guy comes back. The guy who dumped the body was likely a local. How else would he know he could dump there? He probably thought it'd get buried in other people's illegal trash accumulated over the holiday weekend and the sanitation crew wouldn't have bothered to investigate. When I think about how this guy lives in my community, it makes me feel physically ill. To think that he had clearly scouted the area for a dump site, that it may have not been the first time this had happened that this could happen again. If I hadn't called it in, if I hadn't been in the backyard at that exact moment, or if I had ignored that gut feeling, the victim would have never been found, may never find potential justice, their loved ones may never have closure. In fact, there's a possibility that it just might happen again to another poor soul. I hope it's not me. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I recently discovered this sub and immediately thought of this experience that happened to me two summers ago while I was cat sitting and house sitting for an older couple I met in a French class I was taking. This couple lived near a busy corner with a bookshop, coffee shop, a grocery store, and a movie theater in a nice neighborhood of a big city. For all these reasons and more, I was pretty excited to house sit there. My own apartment, where I lived with my boyfriend and my own cat, was about a 10 minute drive to 40 minute walk further up the street in a quiet, residential area with nothing much around it. Now, my own cat is vocal and super social. Because of this, we try never to leave him alone at night because he will literally cry for us all night. We're always slightly paranoid that he's going to get us evicted due to noise complaints from neighbors. We lived on the top floor and you could literally hear him crying from the bottom floor and outside if the door to the building is open. So my boyfriend and I decided that he should stay at the apartment with our cat while I was house sitting. My boyfriend drops me off at the house and I settle in with my luggage. Look around the surprisingly large three-story house and then decide to walk over to the grocery store to pick up some food for the next few days. As I'm walking home with my bag of groceries, I notice this man, extremely tall and gaunt, with a head full of long, shaggy hair, walking parallel across the street watching me. I'm only about two houses away from the place where I'm staying, so I sit down on the edge of the wall as though I'm taking a break and call my mom, trying to keep an eye on him surreptitiously from the corner of my eye. This man stops behind a pole across the street and continues to watch me. I tell my mom this guy seems to think that a pole hides him from my view, but that I can see him from there, standing still as a statue, just watching me. I don't want him to know where I'm staying, so we continue chatting and eventually, I turn my full gaze on the man to let him know that I see him watching me. For a moment he doesn't react at all, then he just sort of meanders on down the small street and I watch him turn the corner and disappear from my view. I tell my mom and gather my groceries and walk cautiously down the street, keeping an eye out for him as I near the place I'm house sitting and don't see him. I dart in through the back door next to the garage as quickly as I can and breathe a sigh of relief once I'm inside. I tell my mom everything's good and I put away the groceries and forget about the entire incident. The couple has a beautiful library, so I continually spend the rest of the afternoon and well into the evening just perusing their walls of books and selecting a few to bring upstairs to the guest bedroom on the third floor. I'm playing some music and just enjoying the quiet downtime all to myself. I finally get sleepy, text my boyfriend goodnight, and fall asleep. I wake up shortly thereafter after a terrifyingly realistic dream that this gaunt man has walked into the room, trailing his fingertips along my body. The room is dark, all the window blinds shut, and my body goes completely still. Half positive that it wasn't a dream and that he had somehow broken in, it was waiting in the shadow. I quietly reach underneath my pillowcase for my phone. I always keep my phone tucked under my pillow and it's not there. My panic rises and my mind overreacts. 
He's here and he's playing a game with me. He took my phone. He's somewhere in the house. I desperately begin to pat around my bed as quietly as possible, searching beneath the other pillow for my phone. Not there. I think, surely he'll hear me if I get out of my bed to look. But I suddenly remember that I left my laptop next to me on the bed and I open it, quickly sending text after text to my boyfriend through iMessage until he wakes up. I tell him I can't find my phone, had a bad dream, and I'm super anxious. With him awake and responding, I get the courage to flip on the lamp and get out of bed. I search around the floor, thinking my phone must have fallen while I was sleeping. Nope, not on the floor. Finally, as I search the bed frantically, I find it atop the covers on the other side of the bed. Weird, but I suppose I must have knocked it across the bed or something. I don't sleep well the rest of the night, hearing noises from across the three floors of the creaky stairs and house, thinking anyone could break in through the patio door across from my room. All they'd have to do is get to the balcony and wake up the next morning exhausted. The next day, I'm sitting in the living room at their piano practicing. I'm an opera singer, and I was mostly excited about this house sitting because I'd get the chance to sing without worrying about apartment neighbors complaining, with the blinds open. There are some kids riding their bikes, neighbors with dogs, the usual. I'm enjoying my afternoon when I notice there's an odd, run-down, dilapidated, dark house nearly diagonal to this one, which doesn't fit in at all with the otherwise nice neighborhood. Gaunt man walks out of it and sits on the porch. My stomach drops. I call my boyfriend and tell him that the creepy guy apparently lives across the street. I shut the blinds facing that way so that he can't see me and retreat to the other side of the house with the kitchen. I spend the rest of the day chilling, convincing myself that I'm overreacting, that everything is fine and I don't need to worry. Nonetheless, come nightfall, the house seems just way too large, with too many entrances and the bottom floor is so far away that I worry the noise wouldn't carry up to the top floor if someone did break in. Naturally, I cannot sleep at all. I end up retrieving a knife from the kitchen and stashing it under my pillow. Noises keep me up. Creaks, odd sounds. Around 11 p.m., I call my boyfriend and beg him to come stay with me, assuring him that our cat could survive one night without us. He drives over and pulls into the garage. I come unlock the hall door from the garage to let him inside. I still don't sleep well, but at least I get some sleep with him here, feeling a little safer. He gets a little weirded out about the knife under the pillow and tells me to put it back where I got it. I stash it in the bedside drawer, just in case. The next day, I pull it together and tell him he doesn't need to stay. I'm clearly overreacting. Then comes nightfall and the prolifera of odd noises. I decide I can't stay in the guest room at the top floor anymore because I feel like I can't hear anything. I go down to the second floor and try to sleep on the couch in their media room. George of the Jungle is on TV and I try to fall asleep while watching that. Instead, I get more and more paranoid that I won't be able to hear anything over the movie and end up switching the movie off. I try to fall asleep again. Now I'm sure that I can hear noises from both above and below me. Not the cat who, every night, hid in a tote bag in their bedroom on the second floor and never made a sound except to hiss at me when we crossed each other's paths. I get no sleep, patrolling the entire house all night, finally falling asleep as the night sky tinged to gray with dawn. The next day was my birthday, and his little sister was flying up from across the country to spend a week with us. He couldn't stay the night with me anymore because she was still quite young and needed adult supervision, and I insisted that she stay at our place rather than have them come to the house I was at. Fortunately, my best friend had just returned from her trip, and we decided to have a birthday sleepover. I feel a little paranoid, but again, I'm able to get some sleep with someone else there and wake up a little more refreshed. She leaves, and I sit in the kitchen, which faces the street where Gauntman first saw me. Gauntman is across the street, walking and watching. I duck down against the wall below the window, placing my phone at the gap between the blinds with only the top of my head showing. Gauntman gets closer, still watching as I hit record on the video. I get several seconds of him watching the house until he suddenly seems to notice the top of my head or the phone and snaps his own gaze back to the sidewalk below him and walks on. My heart is pounding. Now he knows that I've watched him watching me again. Probably saw the phone recording or taking a photo and he lives right across the street, where he often sat on his porch for hours smoking with a couple of other men, facing my direction. The next few nights were a blur of me wandering around the house, checking closets and other closed spaces upon returning from going out, placing chairs against entrances so that I'd hear them scrape if they got moved, half sleeping in the media room, double checking windows, exhausted until the couple of hours of sleep I would get when the sky would tinge gray and I'd felt I'd survive the most dangerous part of the night. My best friend found out I wasn't sleeping at all and offered to stay with me for the last night. Boyfriend's little sister was still there so he couldn't. I accepted her offer, feeling foolish and overdramatic, but thankful. We stayed back in the guest room on the top floor, watching Parks and Rec quietly with the subtitles on, so that I could still hear the rest of the house. 
It was around 1am or so when a shrill, piercing siren suddenly echoed throughout the house. My best friend and I sat up in bed, paralyzed for a moment with fear and confusion. Did they say anything about an alarm? She asked me. No, I responded, hesitantly, wondering if I had missed something in the notes they had left. We stared at each other for another long moment. What should we do? She asked. I don't know, I said. We should shut the door and lock it, right? She was the closest to the door. She shut it quickly and locked it. I moved the nightstand in front of it, a pathetic barricade. The siren continued to wail throughout the house. Should we call the police? I asked, my heart pounding into my mouth, opening the blinds with my hands and trying to peer through the dark street below. There was a window to the bathroom with the access from the balcony patio. I checked it, just to make sure yet again that it was shut and locked. We should probably call the police. Or should we? She had already begun to call the police, telling them that we were house-sitting and an alarm had just gone off. We were concerned about a man who had been watching me over the past few days and we were alone in the house. The police got our address and said that they would arrive soon. Suddenly, the alarm stopped. With the alarm off, we gathered the courage to remove the nightstand from the door and unlock it. I had Pepper Mace gripped tightly in my hand as we swung the door open, ready to confront whatever was out there. Nothing. No one. I checked the giant glass door a few steps away that led to the balcony patio. Locked. We made our way down the stairs, cautious, quiet. We finally made it down to the bottom floor when there was pounding at the front door. I hurriedly made it over to the door, removing the chair I had placed in front of it as quickly as I could, letting in two policemen. They identified themselves to the door. They came inside, asked me a few questions about this man, and then decided it was probably just a harmless homeless man. I didn't tell them that he lived across the street because I thought they'd accuse me of overreacting. Quote unquote, he was just walking home, not following you or watching you. End quote. They couldn't find a security system and told us that it was the fire alarm that had gone off, but they couldn't figure out why. After checking the house and finding no one, they left. I emailed the owners the next day to tell them what happened and that we had called the police to come check it out. They apologized that it happened and thought it was strange. I left the next day and politely declined house sitting for them when they asked again a few months later. We moved out of the city and across the country last summer. My boyfriend only recently told me that he and my dad, who had come up to help us move, had seen Gauntman walking across the street from our apartment and that last week before we moved. So Gauntman, even if you weren't stalking and watching me, let's not ever meet again. A couple years ago, one of my closest friends relocated cross-country with his long-term girlfriend to a work job he couldn't refuse. Only issue he had was that he did not want to fly his dogs out with them when they made the move since they'd be staying in a hotel for the first month. He was also a bit reticent to fly them out due to health concerns for both pets. By the time he located a home to rent, he was missing his dogs and made the request of his sister, another close friend, and myself to drive them to him in LA. Now we're Chicago folks, so the trip would be a long one, however. With the three of us to foot the near 30 hour drive, it would be a piece of cake. We left early and drove long hours. Along the way, it was decided between my friend and I that if we'd foot the majority of the drive ourselves, and if we needed to, we'd let our friend's sister do some driving. We were on a bit of a time crunch due to a snafu with the rental agreement, so we didn't have the luxury to stop very often past an 8 hour stay at a Denver LA Quinta Inn. As for the journey itself, it was relatively smooth, bearing getting pulled over right before entering Utah for driving for 2 miles in the left lane of an empty highway. Whoops. From that point, we made it through Utah, Arizona and Nevada without much trouble until we entered California in need of gas. I had been driving for the majority of the first day and tagged my buddy in after being pulled over. I remained in the shotgun seat as navigator, searching through the GPS for a fuel stop. We kept up our eyes peeled for road signs and discovered a sign pointing to Yermo Ghost Town or something along those lines, which had a mobile station. How wonderful. It was convenient too, as it was located almost directly off of the interstate. We rolled in on a little more than fumes when we approached the pumps. Normally, we let the dogs out at every rest stop, but having stopped not long before then, and with both dogs sleeping snugly in the back, I decided to pump gas without anyone else leaving the vehicle. My buddy pulled us up on the opposite side of a beat up green sedan with a short, plump gentleman who just turned in to approach the shop. I noticed a few other hoopties at the pumps, all unoccupied, and there were a couple of other cars parked up near the station, most likely belonging to the employees. So nothing seemed out of the ordinary until I swiped my credit card. The pump rejected my first swipe attempt, which I chalked up to a misread. I swiped again and the pump reads out, please see attendant. I was annoyed but we needed gas. I tapped on the window and told my buddy what I was doing and asked if anyone needed anything. After taking their orders for Gatorade and Marlboro Reds, I walked up to the store and made a mental note of how strange this gas station was. Kinda quiet, 
especially for one right off the interstate, but that's no matter. As I walked in though, more weirdness. First thing I noticed is that there are some boxes of chips just left on the floor, like someone was stocking shelves and just quit. As I veered to my right, I noticed that immediately there is no one milling about in this place. With the six cars beside my own out there, I felt like I would see someone. Things got even weirder when I realized that there was no one behind the counter, no customers or workers, and then it dawned on me. What had happened to the gentleman who was at the pub adjacent to mine? Surely they can't all be in the bathroom. This is where I began to feel this gnawing cessation in my stomach. Something isn't right. I have always been a person who felt like I could trust my instincts, and those instincts were screaming at me just to get out of there. I want to run, but I hold back. I would look suspicious booking it out of a gas station that was empty and decide to just play it cool. Natural. Don't let your body language let on to how badly you're freaking out in your head. I was probably inside of this gas station for only a couple minutes when I left, but I stopped just before exiting to listen for something. Anything. A flushing toilet would have been a good sound, but nothing. As I exit the shop and see my car, I begin to feel dread. It's like that moment in a movie where the hero is about to make it to the end of their trial, but the celebratory fanfare disappears, and in that silence, something comes and strikes them down. I am about 25 yards from the car when I see this gentleman come out from around the side of the shop opposite of me. This is not the same man as I saw while pumping gas. He was larger and had a peculiar look on his face. The best way I could describe it, it was like Nick Cage's smile from Face Off before the titular act had occurred. I continued walking towards my car, but when I turned back to look at him, he was now walking towards me with a purpose. At this point, I noped my way back to the car with increased urgency in my step. And of course, my friend has the door to the car locked like a complete douche clown. There is also the 95 pound golden retriever sitting in my seat. Apparently, my travel companions did not notice how freaked out I was, or the creepy gentleman still walking in my direction. I punched the window and told him to unlock the door, to which he only half rolls down the window to tell me the dog was in my seat and they were afraid she'd jump out when I opened the door. I reached my hand in and threw the dog towards the back seat as hard as I could, while my friend is just now realizing how freaked out I am. He started the car and drove off quickly. I took one last look back and saw the guy had stopped about a pump away from where we were, still with that same look on his face. We found another gas station further down the road, this time with a ton of people inside and out. After thoroughly creeping out my friends with the story as I pumped gas, we made our way back to the interstate, which meant passing that gas station again. It's been about 15 minutes since we pulled out initially, and we go silent as we notice that those very same cars are still sitting in the same spots where we had left them. After thoroughly freaking out for a few miles, I received a phone call from my credit card company about a $100 charge at a mobile station. The lady on the phone was really helpful in fixing the situation for me and was as entirely creeped out by the situation as we were. In the end, we made it to LA and had a great vacation, but it still bothers me as to what was going on at this little gas station off the highway and what was that smiley man story. So, crazy smiley man and whoever else was lying in wait at the Yermo Ghost Town exit mobile station, let's not meet. I lived in New Mexico for several years before moving to the Midwest. My friend, Amy, and I, both females, would spend many days exploring the remote corners of the New Mexico, discovering abandoned ghost towns and enjoying the quiet, desolate beauty of the desert. One afternoon in March 2010, we were traveling from Ruidoso to Albuquerque. Always up for exploring, we took a back road rather than traveling the more direct highway. One leg of our journey had us on NM55. It's a remote, teeny tiny two-lane highway. We love those types of roads, up until that day. This part of New Mexico's flat and desolate desert, you can see for miles, and there's virtually nothing except dirt and rock between towns, and towns can be miles apart. So we were on NM55 going north. After a few minutes, we saw a white pickup truck up ahead of us, going the same direction. Suddenly, he stopped his truck sideways in the middle of the highway, blocking both lanes. We were about a mile away from him, and as we got closer, we began to get uneasy. We could see no reason for him to do this. We were the only other vehicle out there and we began wondering if we should turn around rather than come up to him and have to stop. We were about a half a mile away from him when he pulled over to the opposite side of the highway but his truck was still pointed the direction we were going. We tried to relax a little. Surely, this guy was a rancher or something. Maybe he was checking something on his land. As we passed him, we noticed a few things. One, there was only one person in the truck, a middle-aged guy who never took his eyes off us, and two, he was talking into a walkie-talkie. A few seconds after we passed him, he pulled back onto the highway and started following us, but he never got too close. He would get to within a few car lengths and then drop back a little and then speed back up again to within a few car lengths. We were getting nervous. 
we realized how alone we really were. We had seen no other traffic on that road, and we hadn't told anyone about our great idea to take this detour. We checked our cell phones, and neither one had signal. Typical for remote New Mexico, but scary given our present situation. Amy was driving and speeding up while I frantically checked the map, hoping to find a road that would have more traffic. There was no other road. We had to travel this one to get to the next town, mountain air. Turning around to go back the other way didn't seem like a good option. After a few minutes, we saw another pickup truck coming towards us. He was going very, very slowly, maybe 20 miles per hour, if that. This pickup was old and beat up, whereas the one that was behind us was newer. Amy had us up to 75 miles per hour, which wasn't typical for us on these 55 mile per hour highways, and we blew by the old pickup. As we passed it, we saw that it was another middle-aged guy, and he was talking into a walkie-talkie. After the white pickup passed him, he pulled a U-turn and pulled in behind it. As we watched all of this, we could see the white pickup truck guy talking into his walkie-talkie. No doubt these two knew each other. We were being deliberately followed, and for the first and only time in my life, I felt hunted. They stayed right behind us. We watched for obstacles in the road. We truly thought old beat up pickup guy had set up a trap in the road and our vehicle would be disabled somehow. We talked about driving into the fields, we were in an SUV, but this was obviously their territory and we were afraid of what would happen if we went off road and got cornered. So we stayed on the highway. By now, white pickup truck guy was right on top of us. We could see him talking into the walkie talkie and he stayed right on our bumper. And old beat up pickup truck guy was right on top of him. The three of us sped down the highway. The white pickup inched closer. His maneuvering and edging closer made it apparent that he was trying to bump us. I watched helplessly as he got to within inches of our back bumper. Amy floored it. We were passing 80 miles per hour and edging up to 90. The road was flat and deserted, but any little thing going wrong would have been catastrophic. We absolutely were not going to slow down or stop if we could help it. The white pickup pulled into the opposite lane and started to gain speed. The only thing we could think of was that he wanted to pass us and get in front of us. If he got in front of us and his buddy was behind us, then we'd be boxed in and trapped. We looked frantically at the rocky desert on both sides of us. Our only option was to off-road it. As we topped a small incline, we saw a sign that said Salinas Pueblo Missions National Monument, and it pointed towards a road on the left. And right at that moment, a blue pickup truck pulled out of the road and onto the highway in front of us. As we came up on the blue pickup, we saw the plate said US Park Service. We looked at each other and then looked behind us. Both pickup trucks did U-turns and went the other way. We followed the blue pickup to Mountain Air and then made our way to Albuquerque. I don't know exactly what those guys' intentions were, but they weren't good. There is something seriously wrong out there. I notified the state police and they said they would keep an eye on things. So let's not ever meet, or have anyone else ever meet, these guys. This story occurred roughly 14 years ago, when I was 12 years old and living in east side of an Australian rainforest. When I say rainforest, our house was on a 40 acre property surrounded by bush. The house itself was owned by a Swiss man named Hans. Occasionally, he would come down with his tractor and slash the long grass surrounding our house so we could access slightly more of the property in the summer. We lived about a 40 minute drive from the small town center. This meant that if we needed groceries, medical attention, or to contact our parents, say while we were at school, it would be a 40 minute drive before anything could be done. The house sat on the side of a large mountain, roughly three fourths of the way up so naturally most of the land we called home was strewn with valleys, nooks and hideaways. We had trails we could walk and they led to a stream and a small waterfall. It was a truly beautiful place but considerably scary to me and my small siblings, one brother and one sister slightly younger than me. We knew our neighbors on both sides of the property. But because of the location of our house was pretty remote, our nearest neighbors were roughly a 10 minute drive away. One was a lovely old lady who used to wave to us when we got off the school bus before we made the trek to our house every day. I think our parents asked for her to keep an eye on us. The other was a middle aged man and his family. He was a real jerk who excavated around the bottom border where our properties met and continuously interrupted the stream and waterfall's clear flowing water supply. Lots of strange and creepy stuff happens when you're living in the middle of nowhere but one in particular involved a guy I certainly don't want to meet again. Being pretty removed from people, it was extremely rare that we ever got visitors we didn't know were coming. When people we didn't recognize turned up, it was usually because they were lost and needed directions. One day though, a man in a car came roaring down our driveway. I remember running inside to tell my dad someone weird was here. He immediately walked outside to see who this unwanted guest was. My dad goes outside to see what all the commotion is about while my mom keeps us inside being protective. The man has a large red furred dog in the back of his car that looks like a German Shepherd cross. 
It snarled at my dad, but immediately cowered when this stranger told it to shut up. Our own dog named Millie was snarling and going ballistic while speed chained up to the house. Hi, my name is John. The way the man spoke was like he was a salesman, a really slick and smooth guy who on the outside seemed friendly, but with the overtone of wanting something. My dad immediately responded with, So what are you doing out here then, John? The man was taken aback, obviously not used to dealing with someone as hostile as my dad. They then talked for a while and I could hear my dad talking with a sense of confusion about whatever this man had to say. I did however overhear my dad say, What are you thinking? Just call the cops. I found out later that the lovely old lady next to us had died. Apparently John was on the other side of her property and went to visit and found her dead. He also asked my dad if they should move the body to make it easier for police to investigate. This is obviously why my dad was telling the man to call the police immediately. Anyway, later that night the police showed up to take a statement from my dad and John, who was hanging around our house until the police arrived. I remember my dad pulling an officer aside and explaining that John wanted to move the body when he first arrived. The police left without any more questions as it looked like she had died from natural causes. John was still at our house. I found him to be a very unsettling person. The way he smiled, the dark of his eyes. He was unfamiliar, but acting like he was one of us. I remember it was a school night and I was trying to watch TV and he was playing songs on his guitar with my mom and my dad at the table. I was angry because he was ruining my shows and I told my mom I wanted him to go and I thought he was weird. She smiled and told me she felt the same and told me I should go to bed. The next day things seemed normal, went to school, came home. Not seeing the familiar friendly face of the old woman stung a bit on my way past her house. It felt strange and I hoped that she knew her family loved her before she passed. I was a bit sad on the walk home, until halfway down the driveway, I noticed John's car again and parked out the front of our house. I walked closer and was greeted by his dog, Rusty. He walked outside with my dad and I heard him call Rusty to his car as he was leaving. Apparently he was borrowing tools from my dad. He left and waved goodbye like he was someone that I was going to miss. Again, that sense of overfamiliarity made me feel uncomfortable. I didn't know this man. I didn't like this man and I was hoping he would never come down to our driveway again. My dad then pulled me aside and asked me what I thought of John. I labeled him a weirdo and told my dad I was hoping he wouldn't come back. For the second night in a row, when John returned dad's tools, he was sitting in our house playing guitar and annoying everyone. My mom and my dad were visibly unimpressed by the situation. I heard my mom and dad argue about him hanging around until eventually my dad told him he needed to leave, as it was time for us to go to bed. He insisted it was early and tried to make an excuse to stay. I found that very odd. I was polite enough to know when someone didn't want me around so why didn't this man? Or if he did know, why wouldn't he leave? After ushering him out, my mom and my dad had a big talk in the room and my dad told us all that he didn't like John and that he was going to ask him not to come over anymore and if we saw John again, immediately to tell him. The next day was a Saturday, so we were going to blow up our cheap inflatable pool and go for a swim as it was getting pretty warm. Around 11am, the sound of a car thundering down the driveway alerts me and I go outside. I run back inside to tell my dad that John is back. Just like the first time I ever laid eyes on John, my dad goes outside and we stay inside with my mom, watching and listening through a screen door. John again with his weird, overfamiliar smile and dark eyes greets my dad and is met with, Look, I don't know who you are but I don't want you coming around here anymore. You scare my kids and my wife and I don't want you to come back. You understand? I didn't hear John's reply from his tone, but it sounded like he was confused and tried to reason with my dad. My dad wasn't having it and told him to go or he would call the cops. As he was leaving, my dad said, don't come back or you'll be sorry. This is where things truly get weird. As my dad lays this subtle threat on the man, his face completely changes one of rage. He glares at us in the house sticks up his finger and speeds out of the driveway shouting profanities and churning up gravel, spraying it towards our house. My dad came back and told us we wouldn't be seeing John anymore, and if we did, we were going to call the police. I was relieved. This odd man made me feel uncomfortable in my own home and the way he reacted when he left confirmed the feeling I got from him when I first saw him. I can't remember if it was the Sunday or the Monday after that day, but John did come back. He tried to reason with my dad and say sorry for whatever caused us to not like him. Before he even got out of his car, my dad said, If you don't turn around and leave, I'm going to smash your face in. He did just that. My dad then called the police to inform them of what happened. Apparently they were going to go and talk to John. I didn't hear any more of what happened to that conversation. A few weeks went by with no sightings or happening with John and we all felt like things were back to normal. This was until our mailbox had been tipped out of the ground and smashed, or possibly run over. 
I remember asking my dad what happened, but he wasn't about to give me any ideas. He later told me that he knew it was John after the way their last conversation ended. The next weekend after the mailbox incident, we went into town to get groceries and a fast food dinner as a bit of a treat. And when we came home down the driveway, my dad immediately stopped my mom from proceeding and said that something was wrong. Next to the carport where we parked our car at the back of the house, there was a window that opened to the bathroom. My dad must have spotted the window was missing. As we drove down, he got increasingly more tense until we all noticed the window was missing. I remember being confused in the backseat and not really knowing what was going on until I saw it. A man, dark eyes and overfamiliar coming from the window that led to the shower. My dad was exploding with rage and he told my mom to rush down the driveway. The man proceeded to escape the window and run down the back of our property into thick shrubbery. My dad only being on one leg, let Millie loose as she was going ballistic tied up to the house. She raced down the grass engulfed hill into the darkness. She came back with nothing. My dad went out with his flashlight and couldn't find anything either. I'm not sure if anyone slept that night. None of our possessions have been stolen or even moved. We must have caught this man just as he was entering our house. The police came the next day and searched for fingerprints with no avail. My father was furious and again alerted them to John and his strange behavior. They told us they would look into it once again. That was the last time we heard from John that year. I had almost completely forgotten about him and had the summer off to enjoy myself and get ready for high school. The school I went to was pretty large, considering where we were, but everyone seemed to know each other pretty well, including the teaching staff. Within my first week at the school, we were introduced to all the teachers and teacher aides. I was caught completely unaware when that overfamiliar, dark-eyed man from the previous year was introduced as a teacher aide, except instead of John, he was introduced as Gregory something. I went into a little bit of a spin as I was trying to make sense of all of it. I was 100% sure that this man named Greg something was the same man who had introduced himself to my family as John. At that moment, so many things rushed into my head. What if he killed the old lady? What if he didn't live close by? What if he wanted to move the body so he could frame my dad? If he lied about something as critical as his name, what else was he lying about? What if police never even made contact with him? I was sitting there for a good 10 minutes trying to piece it together until the teacher called my name to bring me back to reality. That is when he noticed me. The look on his face when he saw mine was one I'll never forget. He immediately recognized me. He looked shocked. His eyes were wide and he said nothing, just staring at me. I could sense that he was now the one feeling uncomfortable and on edge. Later that day, I rushed home to tell my dad who I had found. He was shocked and repeatedly asked if I was sure. He went to the school the next day and discovered the man had put in for an indefinite leave yesterday and may not return. When we learned of the news, my dad told me to watch out and let him know should John or Greg ever return. So John, Greg, whoever you are, Let's not ever meet again. When I was 14, I was asked to babysit my three younger cousins, aged 8, 4, and 1, in an extremely rural, mountainous part of Pennsylvania. My aunt and uncle had a wedding to go over to about an hour away and wouldn't be back until very late. Their house was situated on a steep mountainside. Their back deck had a 15-foot drop onto a rocky hill below leading down to a river. Their closest neighbors were about a half a mile away. The closest main road was a mile away, and at night, there were no lights to be seen anywhere around them. Basically, it was in the middle of nowhere, and you would have to know where you're going to get there. You don't just accidentally end up there. My aunt and uncle left us with some pizza and their cell phone number next to their landline. This was the early 2000s, and I didn't have a cell phone, but even if I did, I wouldn't get reception there anyway, and headed out. The baby was already asleep. The four-year-old wasn't feeling well, it was quietly watching TV in the living room as he dozed off, and the 8 year old was playing guitar here with me up on the loft. The loft overlooked the living room to the left, where I could keep an eye on the 4 year old, and there was a huge window that overlooked the driveway to the right. The description of the driveway is an important detail to the story. The road that led to their house ran straight into their forked driveway. It was a dead end road. The house was as far as you could go. Go to the left driveway, there is a large open carport and that's where my aunt and uncle and anyone who ever visited parked. The right driveway led down a very short but very steep hill to a large leveled out area and ended against the garage door that opened to the basement of the house. It was never used as a garage, but served as my uncle's man cave, and where he spent most of his time. Right beside the garage door, a normal door with a window so you could see right in. But this driveway was exclusively used by the kids as a play area because it was the only flat, yard-like area on the property. And being on a mountainside, there isn't much room to safely play otherwise. No cars ever drove down there, ever. There are too many toys and bikes in the way, and friends and family knew this. 
It was about 10 p.m., pitch black outside, no moon to illuminate the area either. My cousin and I were still playing Guitar Hero when headlights caught the corner of my eye, and now my aunt's minivan headlights. Huge truck headlights with those roof lights you often see on jeeps or other off-road trucks. Not only that, the truck was going down the right driveway, the kids play area. This is not my aunt and uncle, this is not anyone they knew. Panic and dread filled my body. I was a small teenage girl, alone in an isolated house on a mountain at night, with three children in my care. In a terrified voice, I asked my cousin, Who is that Jake? Do you know whose truck that is? And then he looked panicked. No, i never seen that truck before, he replied. I quickly ushered him downstairs, still unsure what to do, but the two little ones were sleeping down there and I wanted to make sure they were safe. I checked on the baby and then grabbed the phone to call 911, and then I started to hear the metal garage door being shaken violently. No one ever opened that garage door. More panic fills me. I hear them try the door beside it, the metal door knob jiggling. No one was actually knocking, it's not like they were checking to see if my uncle was down there. Plus, the lights were out. It was dark down there. They knew no one was down there. They were definitely breaking in. The door leading to the basement steps was right next to the phone, so I could clearly hear all this going on. I quickly turned the little lock on the doorknob just in case they did make it into the basement. My heart was practically jumping out of my chest. I'm talking to the 911 dispatcher as my 8 year old cousin clings to my arm. The operator is calm and trying to call me, but I knew it would be at least 30 minutes until a police officer could get up there, assuming they didn't get totally lost on this mountainside in the pitch dark. I just kept thinking, we are dead, this is how I die. The operator asked for the number my aunt and uncle left me so she could have another dispatcher call them to let them know the situation. I turn around to grab the paper with the number on it and to my absolute horror, I see a man peering in a large sliding glass door. A huge, burly, but what had to have been a 6 foot 4 man with long scraggly red hair and a big red bushy beard, and what made it worse, he was grinning at me. Grinning in a way that still scares me to this day. Meanwhile, I had to have looked like a terrified deer in the headlights. I was shaking so hard I could barely hold the phone. There was a second man behind him I couldn't see as well. I have no idea what he looked like, but he was equally as tall but a bit more lanky than the larger man at the sliding glass door. I screamed, oh god they're here, and before the 911 operator could say anything, my 8 year old cousin goes, Mr. Jim? His voice was very confused. It wasn't like my cousin was happy or even relieved to see him. I asked, do you know who that is? But before my cousin could answer, I turned my attention to the man in the door. I'm on the phone with the police, I shouted. I'm grateful he didn't try that door, because I do not think it was locked. The man stared at me hard for a moment, eyebrows furrowed, like deciding what he wanted to do next. But he then just backed away into the darkness. What seemed like an eternity later, I saw the truck lights back up out of the driveway and then back down the road until they disappeared. I was still really scared, and so was my cousin. He had only met that guy a few times, an acquaintance of his dad. It wasn't like it was a close family friend, and obviously, because again, he went down the wrong driveway. Visitors never go down that way. The 911 operator asked for a description of the man, then told me they'd gotten in touch with my aunt and uncle and they were on their way home. She stayed on the phone with me until the police officer showed up a bit later to make sure that the men were gone and they stayed with us until my aunt and uncle got home so they could ask them some questions. My uncle was furious, not at me for calling them home early but at this Mr. Jim guy. My aunt was mad at my uncle and told him to tell Jim to never come back. I didn't know at the time, but my uncle had a drug problem. I don't know what Mr. Jim or his accomplice were doing, or what they would have done if I wasn't on the phone with the police, but that grin was not a friendly one. It was sinister. And again, he also had to have known my uncle was not there, because the basement was dark. He would have seen through the windowed basement door. He had also tried lifting the garage door, something not even my uncle did. He intended to break into the basement, that much is clear to me. There is no other explanation. I never did babysit for them again, and I don't think I ever even went back up there because not long after, my aunt divorced my uncle and moved out. So Mr. Jim, the grinning mountain man who tried to break into the house where I was babysitting, let's not meet again. A few years back, my girlfriend and I, having hiked several other parts of the Appalachian Trail, decided we wanted to give the southern portion of Virginia's trail a shot. It is about 166 miles long, it runs through George Washington and Jefferson National Forest from Roanoke County to Parisburg and Gills County. This is definitely one of the more remote and less traveled parts of the trail, which is exactly what we were looking for. We gathered our gear and made our way to the start of the Virginia Creeper Trail to begin our journey. We had planned our journey to end at Damascus and figured that by the time we got there, we would be more than ready to get home to our own beds. It was early October and the changing of the leaves and colors were amazing. The air was crisp and cool. 
perfect hiking weather with beautiful scenery. The majority of the trip was pretty uneventful, just your typical hike, but our last couple of nights is where things got weird. On this portion of the trail, you're supposed to camp on the trail or a designated shelter. We didn't really want to run into other people and didn't want anyone coming up on us in the middle of the night. We decided to ignore those suggestions and find our own little spot off the trail. A little searching around and we found a spot a little ways off the trail in the middle of a small clearing. It was perfect. We set up camp, cooked some food, talked for a while, then snuggled up and went to sleep for the night. Somewhere around 2am, I was awoke by my girlfriend shaking me awake telling me, Get your gun, someone is outside walking around our tent. She informed me that she woke up to what sounded like someone right outside the tent, running a knife or something along the side while circling us. When hiking, I carry a 1911 with me. You never know exactly who or what you might run into when on such a long hike in a remote location. I got the 1911 out of my pack, and then we sat silently, listening for any sounds. A few minutes of nothing, but the breeze blowing through the trees, and then I heard branches snapping. It sounded like it was a bipedal, based on the way the steps were paced. I turned on the flashlight and flooded the area with light. I thought I saw someone move behind a tree. I yelled out and told them to go away and that I was armed. I kept the light on the area with my gun drawn and slowly approached towards the area where I thought I saw the figure. Then, from my right, I hear what sounds like someone running away through the woods. I spin and face my light that way, and then from the original spot, hear who or whatever was there take off into the woods. There's no way I'm giving chase, so I return to the campsite. I tell my girlfriend about what happened, and I end up sitting guard outside the tent, in the darkness until daybreak. In the morning, I looked around a bit for signs of who or whatever it was, and I discovered a boot print in some soft, moist dirt not far from our tent. It wasn't mine, and it wasn't my girl's. This freaked me out as it confirmed that someone, perhaps more than one, was skulking around our tent in the dark. I kept it to myself because I didn't want to freak my girl out any more than she already was. At this point, we were pretty deep in and still had two days left. That day we walked a little faster than normal and covered as much ground as possible. When it came time to set up camp, I found a spot near a cliff where we could place the tent in a small overhang and prevent anyone from coming up behind us. The whole day up to this point I had a feeling we were being followed. I had no confirmation of this as I hadn't seen or heard anyone else, but it was just a gut feeling. We set up camp and made some food, then retreated to the tent. I assured my girl that if I slept at all, it would be with one eye open. After a while, she drifted off to sleep and I stayed awake listening to the sounds of the woods at night. I was awake for a few hours, just waiting to see if anything was going to happen. At some point, I guess my exhaustion caught up with me and I drifted off. I woke sometime later to what sounded like someone going through our stuff outside the tent. I grabbed my gun and woke my girlfriend, shushing her to be quiet. From that faint glow of the fire, I could see someone's silhouette against the tent. There was really someone out there. I yelled out to them something along the lines of, We are armed, get out of here. They dropped what they were doing and bolted. I came out of the tent, gun drawn and ready to shoot someone. Our stuff was strewn all about. They had rummaged through quite a bit of our stuff. I walked to the edge of the woods in the direction of whoever was out there had fled. There was a creek nearby and I walked to the edge, where there was a small trail running alongside it. Down the creek I could see a light. It looked like a lantern the way it flickered. Then I saw three more emerge from the other side of the woods. I told my girlfriend to start packing up whatever she could and that we are leaving now. We packed up everything of value, left the tent and a few other items and headed back onto the trail, in the middle of the night. I kept hearing people talking off in the woods and hearing branches snap from quite some ways. I kept looking behind us every few seconds to make sure nobody was coming up behind us. It was completely nerve wracking. If something happened, we were still a long ways from anywhere and quite literally on our own, since we hadn't seen another hiker the entire time we had been out there. I really felt we were in serious danger. We had been walking for quite some time when I heard something in the woods behind us. As we rounded a corner, I turned around and saw someone step out onto the trail and just stand there watching us. It was just as the sun was coming up and barely any light. I couldn't make out any features, just the silhouette. I stopped and looked at them for a second and asked them who they were and what they wanted. They just stood there silently, watching us and then turned and walked back into the woods. We picked up the pace and kept going, looking back every so often. We didn't see them again, but my gut told me they were still there for quite a ways. We eventually reached the end of the trail and got to where we had parked my girlfriend's car, extremely exhausted. We made it out of the Virginia woods without becoming a meal for some group of people of whatever knows what. I have no idea who they were or what they wanted. Maybe it was just someone messing with us? I don't know. But I'll never know because I will never be returning to find out. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you.
This happened over a decade ago, somewhere in northern Michigan during the summer. My friend Kathy, my boyfriend's half-sister May, and I drove down from our hometown to visit friends, and we were on our way back home in Kathy's bad little car. By bad, I'm talking this thing had engine problems, overheating problems, ignition problems, it was constantly falling apart. More than once, it had stalled or just stopped working in the middle of the street while we were trying to get somewhere, but Kathy thought we'd be fine since we hadn't had any problems with it on the way to our friend's house. It's a little past midnight and we're roughly an hour away from home. There's nobody on the road, dense woods on every side, no street lights, no moon. I can barely see past the windshield because I have a form of albinism, which leaves me legally blind in my left eye and with really awful vision in my right eye. My death perception is terrible, and I can't see more than a few feet ahead of me at most, but usually I can make out lights and other cars when they pass and sometimes street signs and people when they are close enough. We drove down this narrow, hilly road, and on the descent down a hill, the car makes a strange sound. Kathy starts braking, and we get to the bottom of the hill. The car quits working. Kathy swears and turns on the hazard lights. She and I get out of the vehicle and help pop the hood, which causes a bunch of smoke to fly out. After the smoke mostly clears, Kathy tries to figure out what went wrong this time. We stand in the dark for at least 45 minutes, maybe longer, before we realized she couldn't fix the car and needed a tow truck. These were the days of the MapQuest printouts and brick phones, so we couldn't whip out our smartphone and look up the closest tow truck. I decided to call my boyfriend Caleb to come pick us up and suggest we come with a tow truck to pick up the car when it was daylight. May and Kathy agree, so I take out my cruddy Nokia and called my boyfriend. It's then I realize, no service. I ask May and Kathy if either of them have service, they both check and shake their heads. May gets a bit panicky, and we all hold our phones up, trying to get a signal to no avail. It's really hot, and after failing to get any kind of service, we are all feeling a bit spooked and uncomfortable. May begs us to do something because she is more afraid than Kathy and I. Kathy attempts to call May down, and I wonder if the thick woods and hills are blocking out our reception. I tell May and Kathy to wait by the car, and walk away from them up the hill we had just come down, holding my phone out. Still no signal. I walk further and further away until I reach the top of the hill. I can't see the outline of our car anymore, but I can still hear May at a distance. Even at the top of the hill, I don't get a signal. I know it's gotta be the trees in the way, so I get the idea of climbing up a tree and calling from there, just to see if it works. In hindsight, this was not my brightest idea, but me being an idiot. I saunter off into the woods in search of a climbable tree. At this point, I just want to go home, and this is the only thing on my mind. I find a nice tree with low branches and lift my body upwards towards the trunk. I climb the branches higher and higher and about midway up the tree, I feel my pack of cigarettes fall out of my shorts pocket. I'm kind of annoyed, but figured I can just look for them when I climb back down. I take my phone out and hold it up once I get near the top. I have service. Relieved, I call Caleb, but he doesn't pick up, so I call again until he does. He answers in a sleepy but pissed voice, but I'm having none of that and simply explain our situation. He asks where we are, and I give him the name of the road and my best guess as to how far along we are on it. He says he will be on his way and tells me to go back and wait with May and Kathy, then he yells at me for being stupid and climbing a tree in the dark with my bad death perception. I assure him that I'm fine, he's skeptical but says okay, and we hang up. I start climbing down the tree, but my hand touches a big glob of sap, so I stop and try to wipe the sticky goop off of my shirt. I'm already sweaty and gross, so I'm not too happy about the sap. While I'm failing at getting rid of this crud off my hands, I hear the strangest sound from somewhere below me. Swish, swish, swish. I completely freeze, not being able to place what the sound is, but it's moving pretty fast. I stare down into the darkness below me, but can't see anything. Just hear this noise continuing. It comes closer and closer, and then I hear it right below my tree. Swish. And then it stops, right under my tree. I hold onto the branches as tight as I can and wait. I hear leaves shuffling and twigs snapping, and after a while that stops, and the weird noise starts again, but it's heading away from me deeper into the woods. I wait until I can no longer hear the sound, then finish climbing down and jump out of the tree. It's completely silent now, besides the sounds of the woods, so I grope around on the ground for my cigarettes. I don't find them, so I make my way out of the woods and back towards the road. I jog down the hill, and when I reach the bottom, I notice May and Kathy are not standing outside the car anymore, and the hazard lights are off. I walk over to the car and May rolls on the window a little bit and whispers in a panicked voice, Elizabeth, where were you? I point back over my shoulder towards the hill and started to explain that I called her brother, but Kathy yelled, what are you doing? Get back in the car. I give them a weird look, but Maya unlocks and opens the door and I crawl into the back seat with her, slamming it behind me. 
Kathy slams the locks and double checks them while May rolls up the window and makes sure the rest are rolled up. One of the windows has never closed all the way, but there's less than a finger space, so it's not too big of a deal, but May's freaking out about it and Kathy has lost her cool as well. I am still confused and asked what the heck is going on. Maya tells me that a bit after I went up the hill, some weird person came out of the woods and ran really funny up the hill in the direction I went. They got freaked out and turned the lights off and got in the car. They thought he had got me. I am honestly scared at this point because if I hadn't stopped to wipe sap off my hands, I most likely would have got out of the tree at the time I heard the weird noise. I just knew it was that person. I tell them my story and everybody in the car is super scared but are relieved that Caleb is on his way. We only have to play the waiting game now. We sit on the road for what seems like forever. The dread we were feeling made time seem like it was going slower than normal. Kathy and May are looking out the windows, surveying the area, and I'm just sitting there hoping Caleb will hurry up and come rescue us. Suddenly, I hear May whine, what is that? And she starts crying. Kathy snaps her head to where May is looking and stifles a gasp. I look where they are facing, I see nothing but the dark. But then I hear it through the small opening in the window. Swish, swish, swish. Maid ducks down, as though doing that will make her invisible, and Kathy hides her head behind the steering wheel. I follow their lead and sort of hunch down in my seat, but the noise comes straight up to the window. I can almost make out the silhouette of a tall, skinny man, and then he presses his face against May's window, and I finally see him. Nobody screams. You'd think we would, but it didn't happen. We all just stared at each other. He looks in at us for a while until Kathy switches her brights on hoping it would scare him off, but it did nothing. The dude just walked to the front of the car and stood in front of the headlights. Maybe he thought he could block us from leaving? I don't know. I couldn't make out his features very well, but the guy had to be somewhere a bit over 6 feet and no older than 30 years old. He had the face of your average Joe, nothing special. Nothing really sinister or particularly creepy that you notice about him if you run into this dude in broad daylight. Dark shaved hair, pale skin, long face. May said he had light colored eyes and stubble with eyebrows that made him look like he was always concerned, but there was no way I could make that out, so I had to take her word for it. What was really weird was it was like 80 degrees, and this dude was wearing corduroys, which is what the sound was, corduroys making that swishy sound when you walk, and an oversized sweater with abnormally long sleeves. The sleeves went over his hands and flopped back and forth as he paced around in front of the car. I'm not sure how long he was in front of the car, but it was a while. Then good old Corduroy starts doing something really bizarre. He bends his arms up towards his face, which I can only describe as looking like a praying mantis because of the way his sleeves were hanging, and then he begins walking circles around the car, rhythmically taking two steps forward, one step back like Willy Wonka but on speed or something. This is where I noticed the swish sound matched up exactly to the same sound I heard when I was back in the tree. He was doing the two steps forward, one step back in the woods, when he was going after me, as though this wasn't weird enough. By now, May was sobbing and Kathy seemed like she had to vomit, so I felt like I had to be the brave one. I looked at the slight space in the open window, and when he orbited his way over there, I said, hey man, can you just stop? You're really freaking us out. Quarter War definitely had heard me, so he switched to a halt and looked back into the car through the windshield, straight at me. I asked him very firmly to leave, but he took an extended pause, smiled, then Willy Wonka his way out of my line of vision into the darkness. After a while, Kathy said he disappeared into the woods, and May was like, I can't believe that worked. We awkwardly laughed about what a weirdo he was and glad he left and whatever, and we went back to waiting for Caleb, somewhat reassured but still paranoid. But after some time, Kathy said, oh no, he's back. I couldn't see, but apparently he was doing this two steps forward, one step back parallel to us on the side of the road, and this time he had a big tree branch he was holding with his sweater covered hands. May got scared again, and I held her hand so she'd feel better about it, even though I was ready to piss myself. It was awful, because I didn't know if he was coming towards us, or if he was moving away, or whatever he was up to. It was kind of like when you knew there was going to be a jump scare in a horror movie. Then I hear Corduroy switch back towards the geo and on my window. He smacks it with the tree branch. May and I panic, and I scoot as close to her as possible. They see the dude back up into the woods, then come running back and slamming the branch back into my window like he's jousty with no horse. Thankfully, the window didn't break, but it got terrifying hearing swish, 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 clonk after a while, and he did this repetitively. Kathy perks up in her seat and starts pointing at the road ahead. I see headlights. She blares the horn and flashes the lights. Lo and behold, it's our savior, Caleb. He brought his older brother, Alex, and they both get out of his car and head over to us. May's sobs turn into joyous laughter as her brothers approach. Now Caleb and Alex have always been tall guys. Walking around with them was like walking around with high elves. It felt very safe. Caleb was 6 foot 8 and Alex is around 6 foot 5, so I thought two dudes taller than the corduroy jouster would make him leave. But nope. 
Caleb walks towards Corduroy, trying to assess the situation, and Alex comes over to the car and taps on the window, tells Kathy to get out. She does and he walks over to his car. Then he comes back and puts the car in neutral so he can push it off to the side of the road. May and I slowly get out and May makes a bolt for her brother's car. I help Alex push the car to the side while Caleb distracts the corduroy jouster by holding the end of his stick and telling him to go away. Corduroy yanks the branch away from Caleb and starts backing up by going two steps backward, one step forward, and disappears into the darkness down the street. I can't see him, but Caleb can. The dude backs up pretty far and then comes launching at Caleb who sprints the other way down the road, cause that stick could have really hurt him. He bumps past Alex, who had already got out of the car and was opening his car door, leaving me behind the car alone. Corduroy apparently changed directions and aimed the stick at me, but I couldn't really tell. I just hear everybody shout, Elizabeth, this startles me, and I jump to the side of the car, hearing Corduroy smash the stick into the back window with a loud thud and a swish. I take the long way around the car and sprint off into the road and feel Caleb grab my arm and tug me over Alex's car. I feel the wind has been knocked out of me and my legs don't seem to work, but Caleb manages to shove me in the back seat and scrambles into the passenger side. By now we are all safely in the car and Corduroy is standing like a mantis in front of the headlights again. He would abandoned his stick and just stood there with no intention to move. Alex puts the car into reverse and slams on the gas, making me knock my head against the door. Then makes the sloppiest U-turn ever and nearly drives us into the woods but gets us back onto the road. Everybody was in 100% panic mode as Alex tore away, far over whatever the speed limit was. May and Kathy swear they saw Corduroy chasing behind us after Alex made the U-turn, but there was no way he was catching up. The next day, I went back there with Caleb, Kathy, and the dude from the tow truck place. There was no sign of Corduroy anymore, but when we approached the car, we saw that in the space where the window didn't close all the way were my cigarettes. The box was missing, but they were all neatly jammed in a row along the window space. I have no doubt it was the work of the corduroy jouster. To this day, I wonder if he knew I was up the tree and took my cigarettes, or if he thought I dropped them and went further into the woods to look for me, or if he just found them later and decided to stick them through the window, because he was weird. I also still wonder what his intentions were. I still have so many unanswered questions on that night. Several years ago, I was in a bit of a financial pickle. I was 21 with a bad job history, a bad job, and bad credit. My living situation went sideways, and I had temporarily moved back home with my folks. As anyone who has ever had to move back home as an adult will tell you, this was a terrible situation. I was a rush to get back out on my own, which is why when my best friend, similar position in life at the time, told me that an apartment had opened up at her shady complex, I had actually jumped at it. If you're from around here, then you'll know that every apartment complex in that town is kind of shady. But for those of you who are not here, this place is a shady non-town outside of another non-town, with more liquor stores than any other establishment, and several apartment complexes with no credit checks and same-day move-ins. A couple of months went by, and while the cops did occasionally show up in our parking lot and you had to watch your step for more than one broken bottle, it wasn't the worst place to live. I worked the night shift at a large retailer, shuffling around freight in the back, hating every minute of every shift. So one night, while I trudged up and down a ladder like a zombie at work, my cell phone fell out of my back pocket at the top of the ladder. I grabbed at it, obviously missing, and died a little as I saw it smack the ground and go black. No amount of restarting or shaking could fix it. The LCD was completely shot. Well that's just great, I thought to myself, and decided this was a good enough reason to go home mid-shift. Remember that thing I said about bad job history? Yeah, you can clearly see why. Driving home, at 3am on some random weekday, I turned onto the dark back road that led to my apartment building. I saw something faintly up ahead, in the road, and immediately think it's someone's dog. I pulled up slower, praying that I wasn't coming up on someone's dead pet, and saw that there was actually a teenage boy laying on the side of the road waving. There was a bike laying in the dirt next to him. The kid saw me and jumped, weaving toward the driver's side of my car. Now, I may have made a lot of poor decisions at this point in my life, but thankfully, I hadn't gone completely brain dead. I locked the car doors, but cracked the driver's side window. Are you okay? What happened? Let me get some help. I got hit by a car. They left me. I need help. The kid looked dazed and was cuffed up, but something about him also set my nerves on edge. I'm gonna call for help, okay? I grabbed up my cell phone and then remembered the thing was basically useless due to its ladder plunge. My cell phone was broke, but I live nearby there, okay? I will get help. I hope he didn't think I was lying, but then I didn't care. The kid slammed his hand against my car. Just let me in. I need help now. I promise. I will get help and come back. Everything will be okay. I felt torn. I wasn't going to let this kid into my car, but at the same time, 
I couldn't blame him. If I was scared and hurt, I would probably be frantic too. The kid slammed his hand against the car again and I started driving. I hadn't been exaggerating. It was a 30 second drive to my apartment. I didn't have a landline and I didn't want to somehow lead this kid to my empty apartment with no way of calling for help. I saw my best friend's boyfriend's car parked in her spot and immediately was thankful for the stroke of luck. I ran up the steps to her apartment and began banging on the door. Roy answered the door, probably expecting a crazy person. It was immediately even more alarmed to see me. What is going on? Why aren't you at work? I breathlessly explained that some kid had been hit by a car off the back road, but my cell isn't working and that I needed him to come back with me. Melanie, my best friend, emerged from her room, sleepy and equally confused. Roy immediately took charge, told us both to get into the car, and drove us back to the boy. The kid was still there, waving us down. Roy, a large man, Mel, and myself all got out of the car. Help. I need help. I'm here to help. My friend saw you and came and got me, okay? Calm down. I got jumped by this gang man. They beat me up and stole my backpack and rode off. The kid said frantically. I immediately became alarmed. That's not what he told me at all. I looked at Mel, my face clouding over. I thought you got hit by a car. Why did the gang jump you? What? Yeah, they beat me up and then someone hit me with a car. Plausible. I was still confused though. Roy also seemed very wary of this change in the story. Listen man, let me call an ambulance, okay? Can you tell me your name? The kid lost it. He screwed his face up and clenched his fist, hitting the side of his head. No, 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 no. Just let me in the car, man. Just take me to your house. Roy was done. That's not happening, kid. I'll call an ambulance, and the police, and I can wait with you till they get here, but we can't bring you back with us. The kid slapped the side of his head some more, and then in the most disturbing thing I've ever seen, grabbed fistfuls of his shaggy hair and began pulling it out of his scalp. The sound is still the most disgusting and alarming thing I've ever heard. Roy gave Mel and I the, let's get out of here face, and we jumped back in the car. I'm calling the police, okay? I will tell them you've been hurt and you need an ambulance. Roy began dialing, and the kid started stomping around and screaming. Take me to your house, just let me get in the car, why won't you take me home? The kid stood in the street, blood trickling from where he'd torn up his scalp. Roy got back in the driver's seat and spoke with the cops as the kid raged outside. He then came to the window, staring so intently at us that I felt like my skin had shriveled up and fallen off. He began kicking the tires, and Roy, clearly over it, drove off. The kid grabbed me frantically at the back of the car. Roy drove past our return, around Peters Creek twice to avoid leading the kid to the apartment complex, and then back down our road. The kid was gone. The bike, the kid, just gone. No idea where he took off to. Clumps of his hair were still on the road. We never saw the kid again. We searched the papers and internet to see if he'd been picked up, or if any other strange things had taken place that night. But nothing else ever showed up. What confuses me still about all of it is why he would demand to come back with all three of us. One person could obviously be easily overtaken, but what were his plans for all three of us? In the early 80s, when I was 8, my family was visiting my uncle who lived in Backwoods, Missouri. He lived on a lot of land and the only other people who really even lived on the street were relatives, so no one else ever just happened to be there. This meant no one ever really locked their doors, because random family members were always coming by for this or that. One night, while we were all there, my parents and aunt and uncle decided to go to a nearby town to go bowling, because bowling. My brothers, who were 11 and 12, my female cousins, 6 and 14, and I'm female, stayed home. It was still daylight when the adults left, but it started raining pretty hard and got dark quickly. We used to play this game that was essentially hide and seek in the dark house, but we called it Vampire. There was a thin little mattress on the living room floor that some of the kids would sleep on at night, so the person who was it would lie on the mattress and fold it over themselves like a coffin and count down to midnight. When they got to midnight, they were looking for you, again, all the lights are off, and you tried to make it back to the coffin before you got caught. Because the house was in the country, it was pitch black at night. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. What this meant for the game was that, one, you couldn't tell where the vampire was looking, so you just had to make a break for it, and two, if you were extremely lazy, and I'm sure by now you can guess which one of us met those standards, you could hide in the living room with the coffin and get to base quickly. Ben, my 11 year old brother was it and was doing the normal countdown. I was hiding maybe 6 feet from him. As he's counting, there was a flash of lightning. I don't know if I was already looking at the living room window or if the lightning made me look, but with the backlight of the lightning, I see a man with his face against the window. He had his hands on each side of his face as if he's trying to peer in and looks exactly like the stereotypical creepster. Heavy set, scraggly beard, etc. I could feel every hair on my body standing on end. Immediately, I began trying to convince myself that I didn't see what I saw, but then Ben sternly whispered, if anyone is hiding in here, stay still. I sort of croaked out a, I'm here, right as there was another flash of lightning. Creepster was still there, but was no longer trying to look in the window. Instead, he was now looking toward the front door. Ben and I immediately knew what was coming next. From where he was standing, 
Creepster was probably only five feet from the front door. Ben was the same distance, but there was a couch between him and the door. Ben leapt over the couch and locked the door right as Creepster started trying the handle. At this point, I guess Ben decided that it was best to let the Creepster know that people were home and that we knew he was there, because he flipped on the porch light and then started turning on the lights in the house. This is going to sound weird, but I was too terrified to panic. Having said that, I was relying completely on Ben to know and tell me what to do. He told me to go lock the other doors and was yelling for everyone else to come out and to lock all the windows. Honestly, the next few minutes were hazy in my mind. I remember everything up until this point extremely clearly. Then I remember the end very clearly, but I'm less clear about the middle. I know that I locked the side door and then the sliding glass door in the back of the house. When we talked about it over the years, some people remember us seeing him out the back door as well. I don't think I remember that. What I clearly recall is locking the sliding glass door and standing there frozen and hearing Ben in a very calm but firm voice say, close the curtain, listen to me, okay, close the curtain. So I did. Ben can't remember that part and I just remember my fear in Ben's voice. So I'm not sure if I saw the creepster in the backyard or not. We tried to call the police, but my aunt and uncle had a stupid party line and it wouldn't work. Either from the storm or from a neighbor leaving it off the hook or whatever. For the second, they are the only people I've ever known with a party line, so this wasn't normal to me either. But for those of you who don't know what that is, in really rural areas, multiple people on the street would actually share a phone line. It would have different rings for different households, but you could pick up on the phone and listen to your neighbor's conversation. We also tried to summon help on my uncle's CB radio, but couldn't reach anyone. My uncle was a hunter, so he had a gun rack full of rifles in his room, but my older cousin was on an out of town hunting trip and took them with him. All we could find was a BB gun that looked like a real rifle. I vividly remember Ben putting me on phone duty and Scott, my older brother, on CB duty, while he stood watch at the little square window on the front door with a BB gun. Maybe 30 minutes later, Ben said, he's back, he's coming up the driveway. The rest of us froze in fear, but Ben opened the front door and stepped out on the porch, pointed the gun and said, get out of here right now. Then we hear our cousin Kyle, who lived on the road a bit, say, You know that's a BB gun, right? Even though Kyle was only 15, I remember that we felt like we had been saved when he showed up. Kyle seemed really skeptical of our story, like we were playing a trick on him, even though we had no idea that he was coming, but he stayed with us until our parents came home. Honestly, I don't remember if we even told our parents what happened when they got home. There was definitely no police involvement, though. We just went on with our trip but we never played Vampire again without some mention of that night. Alright, but that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But as always, have a nice day.